Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Harry with Church of the Eternal Logos, and I have the great Father Michael Butler. How are you doing today, sir? I'm well. I'm well. Don't butter me up before I burn it. <laughs> well, you're becoming quite the celebrity now. Again, I saw your recent conversation with Bedros Koulian. That's oh, almost yes. got 100,000 views. Is seventy thousand right now, but who's counting? Right? Yeah, that's hey, that's more than anything I got over here on this channel. So it was it was really quite incredible. Um, meeting Bedros uh, was uh, was really quite uh, it was game changing for me. Right, and uh, yeah, he he I he I think he thinks I'm exotic. That's uh, <laughs> why it sort of caught his attention. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the 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 combination of working out and being an Orthodox priest and well, he's, he said to me uh, one time, he says, Father Mike, you're old, bold, and jacked. Just 
turn that up to 11 and you'll do great. So, <laughs> you know, it's not always the most modest priestly attitude to take, but I find when I can be at least very forward and, and assertive in, in the way that I present myself and all, it seems to garner some attention and people listen and kind of appreciate it. So, right. Yeah. Well, you've been growing quite a bit over on uh, TikTok for sure. Yeah, I have. Uh, yeah, you've been you've garnered quite the following there talking and giving a really good instructive advice for young men. Uh, you. because we're at, at you know, as this the generation, generation Z has generally been called as the lost generation mm -hmm. and um and masculine role models, and that's part of what we're gonna get into with first Christ and then the Orthodox Church that he established. And then manhood. Um, that's kind of what we'll be ta talking on, touching on secular culture, patriotism, all types of things today. So I figured what we could start with is what is a man? Uh, before we even get into some of the details and the theology and history and the church and culture, what exactly would you consider, you know, what is what does it mean to be a man? Uh, you would ask the big $64,000 question, <laughs> wouldn't you? Yeah, right off the bat. Um, yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> the um, um, what did uh, gosh? Now you caught me with my pants down. Uh, largely, what uh, uh, I consider a man. First of all, a male being, you know, as in God created us male and female. Yeah, that seems um, to be uh, you know, so controversial. It, it kind of it should go without saying, but in this day and age. Uh, but to be, I, I think to be a man, um, as opposed to say to, as opposed to say a boy, okay, is that by and large, a man is someone who produces more than he consumes mm -hmm. because a boy consumes more than he produces. He's still dependent. Right. And it is sort of expected and incumbent upon men that we produce more than we consume. That is, we produce enough to where we are able to provide for our own needs, but we're also expected to provide for the needs of others, be that, you know, wife, our family, our children, or to be productive in society or for our employer or, or whatnot. And so uh, part, of, part of being a man is productivity. Part of being a man uh, I think is uh, is also, as I said in the interview to uh, with Bedros, and this is sort of central to the the work that I the, the men's work that I'm doing and sort of the whole coursework and everything that I'm beginning to develop now is that our masculinity or our manhood is is fundamentally a gift from God, right? Fundamentally a gift from God to us for which we should be grateful, right? I, I really believe that we should be grateful that that God created us men. I, women should be grateful that God created them women and to glory in the gifts that femininity provides as well. But in addition to that, having received that gift and been grateful for it, we in turn turn around and use it in service to the rest of the world. Right. So all of the attributes that you know that we typically think of as masculine, be it. Uh, courage, decisiveness, um, uh, initiative, uh, being product productive, protective, uh, our ability as that leadership uh, at adding value and creating value for the rest of the world to making the world a better place, the whole creative um, uh, aspect of being made in God's image that we can take raw things, add value to them, make, some, make them better and return them not only to him in worship, like we say at liturgy, you know, your own of your own, we offer unto you in behalf of all and for all, but also, you know, to return our gifts to the rest of the world. I think all of those go into a definition of what it means to be a man. Right. Now, it's true. It's true. You know, a lot of those characteristics, someone will say, oh, but women do those things too. Granted, uh, where I think it differs, though, is that there are certain qualities and characteristics um, uh, like, for example, Jack Donovan's so-called tactical virtues of strength, honor, mastery, and, and what is it, strength, loyal, mastery, loyalty? No, mm. loyal, man, man. he's got four. I, I, I'm going to mess it up, mess it up right now, trying to rattle it off. Uh, but yeah, women can have those qualities too, but men value their own lives and evaluate themselves according to that hierarchy of or they make we make a hierarchy out of it and 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 rate and grade ourselves as to how well we are honorable how strong we are how courageous we are how in take how much we take initiative and we do it in a way that that not only do we do it for ourselves to judge ourselves as men but we also judge other men 
according to that those criteria as well. And I have never met a woman who evaluated other women based on those typically masculine characteristics. So right. women can be honorable. I've never heard a woman say, wow, she is a genuinely honorable woman. I hold her in high esteem because of that. And yet men do that sort of thing all the time. Right. Yeah. One of the things that I really took away, uh, and Bedros really loved it when you talked about masculinity being a gift from God. And yeah, I'm not quite sure why he why he hit on that so much. It's like he's waiting for me to say something. I have no idea. <laughs> and you know, that was it. He was sort of like he he seized upon it. So yeah. But I do love that idea. And it's true. And femininity is a gift from God. Yeah. But masculinity is something that allows femininity to flourish. And without true. masculinity, um, and you were talking about what reminded me is the fact that mankind are, are the stewards of creation of God's creation mm -hmm. and that masculinity us upholding courageous uh, responsibilities, uh, honor, hard work. Mm -hmm. um, these things put society and the world and creation in a sort of order, uh, a, a, yes. a, an order that resembles the logos itself, which yes. is incarnate in Christ. Yes, yes. And so. Yes which we call reality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a reality. That's not, and that's where, yeah, the people who want to use Christ um, as a metaphor or a narrative, uh, you can, sure, you can use semiotic aspects of scripture and, and the historical story, but it's a reality. And this is, I think, going to be, as we move through our conversation today, what's going to differentiate what I would argue is a Christian masculinity compared to this secular manosphere type culture that isn't really rooted in any particular reason or necessity for masculinity other than attaining social status, acquiring resources, and then having availability with sex, you know, sexual partners. Mm -hmm. And yeah. in masculinity, it may have aspects of that, but it's something way bigger. And the yeah, idea yes, that we're burdened is. with a gift to become the men that we can be is something that we can all live up to. And you look at, again, the lost generation of Gen Z and how many of them are choosing to live up to the man that God had created them to become. And, and they want to complain about society. But I think the one of the best things we can do if we're going to put society back in order is for young men particularly to step up to the plate and become men. Absolutely. And this is sort of central, again, to kind of the, the work I'm developing and, and uh, some coursework I want to develop and begin offering this fall uh, is the notion of mature masculinity. Uh, really what I'm finding, and you probably confirm this for me, please, if you would, you know, the uh, this this monumental influx of young men into the church. Right. Uh, they're coming by thousands. If you yes. look across the whole country, thousands. Every, as I've said, every priest I have on has said yes. that they're having the largest catechism classes they've had. Yes. And it's typically young men between about college age and about 32, 33. You know, right. That's who it is. And what I'm finding is that group of that group of young men uh, are having trouble getting over, getting out of late adult late adolescence into early adulthood right uh sort of the phrase i've used i think i used it on bedros's show uh, as well and I, I i ask young guys this all the time so 15 years of smoking weed and playing video games and jerking off to porn have not been the best preparation for life huh <laughs> no yeah no no it hasn't and you know they sort of reach a stage where they know they need and i, I heard the phrase used they have to adult as a verb, time to begin adulting. And they know they need to, they want to, they want to be responsible. They want, they want meaningful substantive responsibility where they can feel good about themselves and they don't know how to do it. Right. And so I'm finding that that um, you know, even for the young men who come into the church, not only do I have to talk to them about Christ, I have to help them to grow up. Right. And it's it's fascinating work. And I've realized it ain't just limited you know, to young men coming to orthodoxy, it seems to be endemic across everyone. And if I can back up just to your point a little bit about uh, the manosphere's view of masculinity, uh, it's, uh, I, I determined about five years ago that it's basically pathological. Uh, if I can use, allowed to use Jungian terminology, it is all shadow forms of masculine archetypes, which right. are ultimately unhealthy uh, and will, will eventually harm you. They really right. will. So yeah, we can. We I'd be happy to talk about that. Yeah. Um, 
Can we? So, can, I, can I respond to something in the okay. in the, the the chat over here yeah, on the side? Yeah. Because I, I do have something. I like this question here of uh, Sean Jay. Does the church have any historical ritual or ceremony to recognize a boy becoming a man? Anything in the tradition, uh, by way of kind of sacrament or sort of ritual action independently? I don't think we do. However, there is something in the church that very much mimics every traditional. Uh, and historical um, uh, rite of passage for boys. And it's right in front of our eyes, and we just don't see it. What I'm talking about is altar service. Mm. We take a boy out from the larger community, especially away from the, the community of women. We put him in an all-male environment with the ritual elder, that would be me, or the priest. He has no speaking part. He shuts up. We dress him in a stikarian or in a cassock or something. So we take away his personality. He's reduced to a unit or to a cipher. He does not serve himself. He serves the priest. He serves the church. He serves Christ. He serves the congregation. He does not serve himself. He stands close and listens to the, to the, the, the central mystery of the church. He hears the prayers of the anaphora said up close. He watches the priest raise his hands for the epiclesis, the calling of, of the Holy Spirit on the gifts. He perceives and sees in that what is actually a male mode of receptivity. And then he watches the priest, you know, commune himself from the holy gifts. And he sees that then, yes, the priest receives the gifts himself. So he's able to nourish and provide for himself. But most of what he produces, he in turn gives out to the rest of the community. And that men do not nourish with milk. The priest nourishes with blood, the blood of Christ. And these are like traditional elements in every historical you know, rite of passage around the world. And we do it. And there it is right in front of our face. I got to write an article about that. because That would be huge. Yeah, is, because... it's, it's fascinating, you know? Yeah. And like I say, it's just, it's right there. It's right there. And well, there, yet, that's one of the problems with Western society is there's, there is no demarcation between when a boy becomes a man. And, and, you know, that's where neoteny is a biological term that regard to the retention of juvenile characteristics. And we can see this in the animal kingdom, where if you take a pig and you put it in a pen, it maintains pink skin. Or if you let that pig go wild, he'll then develop tusk, hair, thicker skin, dark skin. And the idea is that the environment can control the physical maturation of a species. And so when we look at, and this is something I've talked about on the channel, when we look at our society, and the retaining of juvenile characteristics into adulthood more and more. I think when we look at Marvel movies, the superhero movies, uh, Funko Pops, poor diets, you know, all this different stuff. These are inabilities for young men to actually become men. And so and then they're like 40 year old kids. And yeah. it's it's a neotenous characteristic. And this is absolutely detrimental to our society because those men yeah. One, they're not going to maintain order. They're not going to maintain and shoulder larger responsibilities. Few of them are getting married. Few of them are going to actually have children. And few of them are going to belong to a patriarchy itself, which, again, orthodoxy and Christianity offers. Yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, I mean, it was when was it? Was it early 20th century that the term adolescent or adolescence as a stage in human development became a thing? I mean, I, I think it's fairly recent. You know, and now we have late adolescence and, and post adolescence and all. And you're right, we've ex simply extended childhood. Right. Look, look, you know, my for myself, you know, I, I got married. My, my anniversary is, is on the 6th, and it'll be 38 years for me and my wife. I got married at, how old was I? 25. I think I was 25 when I got married. My mother got married at 19. You know? And my grandmother got married at, I think, 15, you know, and so nowadays, you know, my, my sons, my, my sons are getting married at 30. Right. Okay. So, you know, the, and, and, and I know I'm, I, this, there is no blame in this, right. you know, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why uh, young people are not getting married until they're in their early thirties. They're social, they're economic. They're, there's a whole lot of things. I lay right. no blame on, on them at all about this whether it's crippling college debt or or you know lousy uh starting salaries you know they got right. a great career but they got a you know an, a, a basic job in, the, in their industry and they're not making much money the cost of houses my god 
Both right. my boys are looking for houses right now. I'm terrified. You know, you know, sooner or later I'm going to retire and I'm going to have to move out of the rectory and buy one. You know, <laughs> the very thought is kind of terrifying. You know, I've seen what, what they cost now. Right. But, you know, again, and then, you know, we have issues with, uh, you know, almost all young men have issues with pornography, you know, and with and, and with um, uh, masturbation as a means of, of self-medication and self-soothing and all. Well, what do you do when we hit puberty at 13, but we're not getting married until we're 30? Right. What do you do with our most fertile and our strongest years? I, I don't have any easy answer for that. Right. I, I really don't. And, and I feel for the young guys. You know, having to navigate that, you know, and just say, oh, simply no fap and, you know, just be chasing. High. It's real nice if you can do that. I know. But for a lot of guys, that's kind of a tall order to fulfill. And, you know, so a, a lot of ministry, you know, that we do and a lot of confessions that I hear are, you know, a sort of remediation and helping people deal with, you know, sort of society wide structures that leave them incapable of living the kind of lives that they want. Right. And and that aids to what I'm talking about in regards to our environment, creating the otanist characteristics in the species itself. So like you pointed out, uh, you know, the ability to get a well-paying job, buy a home, have be married, have children like I myself, like your sons. I just got engaged to, uh, you know, a beautiful Orthodox girl. So shout out to Jenny. Congratulations. Uh, so I'll be getting married this year. But uh, my criticisms aimed at me as well and in for everybody but you know i look at life and i really wasn't able to even potentially be a suiting partner to be a husband yet because yeah. of the way that society is structured and so in a way we are in a pig pen and yeah. then therefore we are retaining juvenile characteristics later and later and later into life some people finally maturate i would say uh, marriage would be certainly one of them that allows men to maturate uh, women typically help with that process, but, um, you know, there's uh, being able to own something, having a career or a work or a job that you really are devoted in and care about and have some type of passion. Uh, you know, a lot of the young men just can't find an answer to any of these questions. And yeah. so they're just they're stuck chasing their tail and really failing to grow up because their only concern is about themselves. And this will can come back to then when we look at Christ, he is the ultimate icon example of what a man is because he shouldered all this responsibility that he wasn't guilty for. Yes. And that's what it means to be a father. I mean, your household, your children, like you're shouldering the responsibility for sheltering and taking care of and providing for your family. Mm -hmm. And that that is an act of I would say that's a godly act. That is, as you're talking about, the gift of masculinity that God gives us. We have to develop. And then that's a gift that we give to other people, our children, our wives, our family. Yeah. In fact, just as you say that, this reminds me, there's this there's this lovely term in Russian, podvig, which loosely translates ascetical struggle. And your podvig is the struggle that your life has is that's how you work out your salvation. Mm hmm. And you know, for me, it means being a priest of a congregation, husband to my wife, father to my sons, the other responsibilities that I have in my life, your podvig will be different. Right. But, you know, it is precisely those responsibilities and the day to day burdens of life that we have to that, that we shoulder and we bear with good grace and as much charity and patience as we possibly can. That ultimately makes for our salvation. Right. Uh, and, and so, you know, just as you say that, it, I'm going to have to think about this some more, but I'm wondering if the inability or the refusal to grow up is, in fact, a refusal of the cross which Christ places upon us, if there's not a sort of a salvific or, you know, economy, aspect of our own salvation or economia that's somehow wrapped up in this. Right. You know, a, a, a depth, a depth of meaning beyond what I've already begun to think about. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. Just oh, no problem. Um, and so this is something that I think then these young men that are converting to orthodoxy, especially my channel, my channel is majority young men. Um, well, so but, is mine. Like 94% <laughs> male. You know, like yeah. 35, yeah. Um, but orthodoxy offers them something deeper in multiple levels. Yeah. And it, it offers deeper meaning in regards to your faith regards to the historicity of of the church you belong to it gives you a patriarchy 
to meet with other men. And so maybe this would be the next question I'd ask for you is, you know, it's very common to talk about how you can't become a man without other men. And so unfortunately, I, I do one on ones, uh, you know, just to help people. They, they want to talk about whatever they want to talk about. They can have my undivided attention. And so many of the, the younger men that I've talked to uh, don't have a father. They don't know. They're not close to their biological father. They only know their mother. Um, and so I if you ask him, like, who, OK, so who is like your sort of masculine role model? Crickets. Uh, and then it becomes people that they would consume through a black mirror, their phone, their computer screen or something like this. But again, as you're talking with Bedros, your masculine influence has to be personal. Again, we are orthodox. We believe in a personhood theology. That's the beginning point of our theology is personhood made in the image of God. And therefore, you need to be in a community of men. And that's something that my church and my parish has been taking on is that we start having <laughs> what my godfather, Subdeacon Mark, says, uh, manly men doing manly things in a manly way. <laughs> so we, we whether we go to a shooting range or I think the next one, we're going to go drink beer and go to a pizza place after Vespers. Um, but you need other men. And we, as I've talked about before, men sort each other out. We naturally sort each other out into the hierarchy where women are terrible at that. And so we look at our society. And well, women's, women's hierarchies are different. That's right. That, yeah, ours are vertical. There's tend to be more horizontal and, and communal. Yeah, exactly. And so we we sort each other out so much better. Anybody who's played team sports, anybody who's been in a locker room, you know, knows, OK, you're trying out for the football team within two or three days. You already know who's the biggest, who's the strongest, who's the baddest, who's the best, who's the fastest. And there's already been a sort of hierarchy that's well, been established. What? what bring a new boy in to serve among the altar servers they sort themselves by height if by nothing else you know mine might do this <laughs> <laughs> you know nobody has to tell them that they just see it and you know he's taller than me so i go you know i keep moving down until you know, until i find my place yeah yeah so um could you speak a little bit to then how uh, a patriarchy and how men are, are essential for other men to develop themselves and be and, and mature. Yeah, um, I don't know exactly how patriarchy fits in on this, but the the presence and the 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 active engagement of other men is necessary, I think, for us to grow up um, in every traditional culture and sort of every sort of rite of passage for men. See, it's I, I have this pet peeve for guys who men who think that they're going to initiate their sons. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's possible. Okay. Mm. There's too much role contamination there. And part of male initiation is, is not only separation from the mother and all things feminine and all things childhood, but it also involves separation from the father. Mm. And you can't separate from dad if he's right there running the damn thing. Right. Okay. So it requires other men, a broader community of men. And this is part of what masculine, mature masculinity requires is that for a young man to take his place among other more mature men, first of all, to show that he has something of value to offer. Okay. That's absolutely essential. We have to, have, right. it may not be much. You may be the funny guy who lightens moods. You, you know, even I, I remember in high school, there was this very, very small, short, little skinny guy who absolutely loved football. Well, we were in Texas, so everybody loved football. <laughs> yeah. That's but, like basketball here in Indiana. Yeah. So, but he wanted to play. He wanted to play football. It's just too small. They, they made him sort of a team manager or something, but the guy wore a uniform. He was there on the sidelines. You know, he, you know, he'd bring water. He had, you know, he'd, he'd wipe off helmets. He'd wipe off balls. He'd you know, do anything that he could to help the team, you know, but he was there. He had a place. It was sort of a low place on the hierarchy, but he had a place. He fulfilled his role. He performed a function. He added value to the team and he was a valued member. Right. You know, competency. Male competency. competency. Yes, he had competence and it was recognized by the rest of the team and they loved what he did and he, and, he, and he helped. In his own way, he helped. He added something. And so part of what the community, larger community of men requires of us is that it calls us out of ourselves to show that we have something of value to offer. Right. And there's also then on the part of the larger community of men, the recognition of our own manhood. 
right because it's it's something that's almost bestowed we recognize that you have something of value that you're able to provide provide here that you're not a drag on the community that you know we're not you know you're not a liability right you know you're not cannon fodder when it comes to if, if it comes to a fight right you know and so there is among other men kind of a recognition that yeah this guy has something he's one of us come on you know and that's that's really essential and i i remember when i was accepted in different groups you know at different times and it was it was a beautiful thing i had a place and because right. i had a place and i had a rank i knew where i was i knew where i belonged and it's extremely comfortable for men when right. they have a place in the hierarchy really yeah they it gives clarity and perception not only of yourself, but but again mm -hmm. of of the larger group and how to orient yourself and who you could become. Maybe again, the wherever you're fixed in the higher or wherever you sit in the hierarchy isn't fixed, and so right. we can develop, we can become more than what we are, and that is essential for I would again as I m described the video for masculine maturation. Yeah, and and this is where we can get into maybe the manosphere and secular culture. Because there's a lot of talk. This is the hottest topic on the internet right now. The manosphere, masculinity, men. But very rarely does objective morality come into this. And this is one of my criticisms that I've laid out, whether it be Rolo Tomasi or or some of these other people that are, are big, big names in the manosphere, is they, they want to talk about, oh, you know, look how upset, you know, inverted society is and how it's detrimentally attacking men yet then they put forth a relativistic form of morality well even if that's the case why would it be bad then for for society to be against men it makes no sense it's self-contradicting and that if we're going to become men and we're going to correct you know the maps the uh, minor attracted persons uh, transgenderism, you know, all the different ills that we're seeing in our society. Maps. Okay. That's their new name. It's for uh, pedophiles. Uh, yeah. That's their new name. And we have to be careful saying certain words because they'll be picked up on YouTube. But maps is what they go by. And they're being added to the LGBTQ plus yada, yada, yada. So now yeah, it's now it's, now it's a sexual orientation. Yeah. And the idea that children could even determine their sex or choose their sex already sexualizes them. And that's the whole that's the whole psychology behind it is, oh, well, my three year old is a girl. Well, if that's the case, that means it, he, that child is sexually conscious and that means it can then consent to sex. And that's the perniciousness in, in I would say, absolute satanic agenda behind it. But if we're going to correct all this stuff, it necessitates men to be moral and there has to be an objective morality. Yes. And, yeah. And so could you speak a little bit to then orthodoxy and Christianity calls men to become men within the domain of our moral lives in, in conjunction okay. with physical fitness and all this other stuff. But morality is huge. Yeah. And I, I suppose the uh, what comes easiest to mind um, uh, when, when I think about that. Um, uh, is is well. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna default to Saint Maximus the Confessor is really what I'm gonna do uh, here. I wrote my dissertation on him 30 years ago. We've been we've been really tight ever since. <laughs> um, but uh, Saint Maximus says, um, and this is this 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 may blow the minds of some of your your listeners, but he he makes this bold claim that the Logos was incarnate three times in creation in the scriptures, and then finally in the flesh. Mm. He was created, or he was he was incarnate in the creation in the self-differentiation of the Logos through the divine energies and the creation of the world. Right. Okay, so that is the presence of the Logos in the created order. He is incarnate in the scriptures through the inspiration of the prophets. And so, and the, you know, so the, you know, the inspiration of the scriptures is, is also an incarnation of the Logos because we can read the scriptures and find Christ on every page. And then, of course, he is incarnate in the in the flesh. And Saint Maximus calls these this the laws of nature, the the natural law, and then the law of grace, or the, the mm. law of the scriptural, the natural law, the scriptural law, and the law of grace. And so, I think when we when we talk about orthodox and we talk about mature masculinity or mature femininity for that reason, or for or, 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 or for all that, that what we're talking about is conforming ourselves to the divine design that's laid out in creation, that is according to natural law. 
And I mean, one of the simple things, you know, when you talk about varieties of, of sexual deviancy, none of them are fecund. None of them produce children. Right. You know, and it's one of those things that, you know, I, I hear far too many discussions of, you know, of human sexuality that say nothing about reproduction or having babies, you know, like it's all for fun. You know, and it isn't. Ultimately, the purpose is for reproduction and, and, and perpetuating the species. Uh, and so that which does not lead towards reproduction is necessarily sterile. It's going to go nowhere. Right. Uh, but I think it, it's pleasure I, without responsibility. It's pleasure without responsibility. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think where sort of, uh, again, to circle back to reality, I think mature masculinity is going to kind of conform to natural law. And natural laws, not you know, I'm not only talking about the laws of physics and gravity, you know, and the the right. constant you know speed of light and those sorts of things. No, I'm talking about fundamental, inherent notions of right and wrong, right. which you know we typically associate with like the second half of the Ten Commandments and all. Like, no one really needs to be taught that taking innocent human life is wrong. I mean, we sort of know that inherently, right. You know? Uh, it takes, you know, a certain perversion of the conscience to get to where people are, you know, uh, are okay with abortion, for example. You right. know, but fundamentally, you know, you and I would not, you know, we would know that an innocent person walking down the street to kill that person would be a gross, it would be a moral outrage. It's just not done. And you don't have to construct an argument to get there. We know it inherently. So there is right. in us an inherent more natural law, which St. Paul talks about in Romans chapter two. Yeah, it's written you know, on the heart. It even, it even has scriptural, you know, we have scriptural approbation for this idea as well. So right. again, sort of getting back to orthodoxy, all of its, its, its ascetical uh, practices, all of its observance, every aspect of orthodoxy, and we very often say is designed to cure the soul. You know, the Metropolitan Orthios Vlachos is very good on that. So are several other people. But what it basically does is orthodoxy wants us to be the most natural human beings that we can be. Right. Fully it's human. Our passions Fully and our man. sins that distort our humanity. Mm. And so when we when we get when we clear up the passions, then again, as Maximus uh, the Confessor says in his disputation with Pyrrhus, he says, virtue is natural to us. Right. We don't have to really acquire virtue. He says it's like when when you scrape the rust off of a sword, it the the steel naturally shines. Right. And it's the same thing with our souls. When we overcome our passions, we overcome our sins. The natural light of the soul comes out. Wow, I love that. So virtuous. Yeah. I, have so, I love Maximus. That's why I have him right here. But I uh, I never heard that one. I love that. I need to read reread uh, his conversation with Pyrrhus. I totally forgot that. Yeah, that it gets a little dry. It's in that particular passage is in paragraphs about eighty six to ninety two. All right, so this maybe save you some. some <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I get it. Yeah, but so, I love that because that highlights sort of the ills, and we can get into the growth of this manosphere thing, the sort of secular secular culture that's trying to give credence and voice to men and young men and the plight mm -hmm. that they're facing and their disenfranchisement in the world. But, um, you know, virtue, morality, ethics, these things aren't really discussed. So it talks about, you know, true things. Okay. Take care of your health and your physical fitness. A man mm -hmm. should be able to, um, you know, act violently, not that he needs to be violent, but there's no virtue yeah, as a man. Yeah. Yeah. If you're if you're just a, a, you know, skin and bones, there's no virtue in the fact that you, you know, you're, you're not violent or you choose not to be because you can't even be. Yes. And in fact, I, I make this I make this case in in a number of other contexts. Uh, you know, if you are poor, oppressed and downtrodden, then there is no virtue, you know, in, in, in your poverty because you can't do anything about it, you know. I remember, I remember, you know, reading about some Athenite monk, you know, one time who says, oh, I am but a doormat under everyone's feet. And I thought, nice statement of humility there. I can approve. But if you are weak and you're oppressed and other people walk all over you, whether you want to or not, you want it or not, I'm not sure there's much virtue there. Right. But if you or I are strong enough to say, I can stand up for myself, but I choose to be a doormat under everyone else's feet. Then I think we've got something. 
Think right. About something. And one of the things that, as you say, in the manosphere, they don't talk much about virtue. Uh, I think it's because sort of, I mean, obviously, sort of secular uh, mindset and all, but they don't recognize that uh, the, the transcendent or the need for relation to something transcendent that is inherent in every person. Right. I did a little video about this a while back on my own YouTube channel where I say um, it was one of the one of the faults in, in men's work in general, where I said, if they don't uh, have some consideration in your men's work for connection to a relationship with something transcendent, yeah, I, I have to talk to a secular audience. So you know, I can say God or, you know, whatever, whatever right, you know, right. your conception thereof or what have you. But everybody's got one. And this, you know, my favorite quotation from St. Augustine, first paragraph of the Confessions, he's talking to God. And St. Augustine says, Lord, you have made us for yourself. And our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And that's it. There is something in each one of us that is never satisfied with anything earthly. It's why you attain the goal, you win the prize, you enjoy it for a moment, then you kind of say, eh, is that all there is? What's the next right. thing? You know? And why nothing on earth ever ultimately satisfies. The high is never high enough. Uh, you know, the, the intimacy is never, you know, extreme enough. There's nothing there, you know, because ultimately our hearts are looking for God. Right. And until we recognize that and somehow fold that inherent natural desire into the work that we're doing uh, as men and even as women, I think the work is going to fall short. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And the world with puts us on a sort of serotonin conveyor belt or um, this this idea that we're, where we are naturally, innately seeking God, seeking something transcendent, seeking more. But it's then the pornography, it's the money, it's Instagram, it's all the dopamine hits. And so the, it's constantly getting us to, okay, we kind of shake ourselves awake after we attain something. Uh, could be sex, could be, you know, sleeping with multiple women and, and that's your goal. And maybe you go through that for, you know, many years. I, you know, my twenties was, was quite degenerate compared to the life that I try to live now, mm -hmm. but you get, once you get the thing, it's exciting at first, but after a while it becomes dull. And then it's like the world gets you to focus on something else. And when we look at the manosphere, um, I see again, uh, getting young men to focus on social status, which isn't a bad thing. None of this stuff is bad in and of itself. It's just once it becomes the ultimate goal, it's limiting. And again, I would say ultimately it's neotenous. And so, um, whether it be social status or sexual opportunities or money and career and success, all of which are good. But if that's your only focus, yeah. well, to me, that's not a man that I want to idolize. And that's not a man who's fully in control of himself and is fully maturated. Cause right. that is just one, that's one, you know, attribute. If we're video game characters, we have all these different cats. That's just one little thing. We're way more than that. And this is why ultimately everything we find in the manosphere is an ideology. And by ideology, I mean a partial explanation for reality that is inadequate, inadequate to the phenomenon it is trying to describe. And it always falls short. Yeah. George. Hey, George. Yeah. Shout well, out to George. I see Mr. Bruno on here. If y'all aren't following George, you need to follow George. This man is stupendous. Yeah, I just had George on. Shout out to George. Uh, I saw that. Thank a, a you. A few streams Thank ago. You. Yeah, it was great. And uh, I love his point right here. The manosphere's best contribution is that it helps start a conversation. I would totally agree with that. Yes. But it comes to self-centered, inverted, and many times perverted conclusions. And that is something I would also absolutely agree with. Um, that you Can look at. That? Go ahead. Can I riff on that? Yeah, yeah, go. Okay. Yeah, I want to riff on Thank you, George. I appreciate that. Yeah, I remember years ago when I first started following some of the stuff in the manosphere. This goes back eight, nine years, maybe. Um, yeah, it was guys trading notes. It was what you know what they were saying. I think, in fact, that's something Rolo Tomasi pointed out uh, several times. You know, it was supposed to be just guys trading notes. What worked, what didn't work. Um, you know, let's find a way to navigate what is now uncertain social waters and intersexual dynamics, things have changed. How do we, how do we do this? 
Mm -hmm. And so exchanging notes is fine. And that's the point I think that George is making. He's absolutely right. That starts the conversation. The problem is, and as I said er, toward the beginning of our talk, if, I'm a, if, if I could please use, um, I want to use Dr. Robert Moore's work, you know, his, his, his famous book, King, Magician, Warrior, and yep. Lover, which familiar. a lot of people who do men's work are familiar with. I want to use that as a heuristic, as a way of approximating an answer in my criticism here. So in, in Moore's work, he describes four principal male archetypes, king, magician, warrior, and lover. And he talks about these as human potentialities, archetypal energies, or whatnot, uh, characteristics uh, and human potentials that every person has. And in the case of men, they sort of come online or they become prominent or they contribute a little more to our personality at different times as we grow older. The first one for men to come online, for example, is warrior energy. It's at right. puberty, all right? And the way that, that Moore describes them, he draws these little triangles, okay? I, I wish I had a, I can't make good triangles with my hands, but anyway, <laughs> at the apex of the triangle is the archetype in its fullness. So what is, you know, the appropriate uh, expression of warrior energy? You know, it's courageous, it is protective, you know, it has strength. There's strategy involved in it, you know, like, like all those sorts of things you think of on the battlefield. You know, these are all very positive things given to the defense, you know, of the weak and all of that sort of stuff. But if you're not accessing that human potential well, then what you're going to end up with is what Moore calls one of two shadow forms. You're going to either end up with not enough warrior energy, or you're going to end up with way too much of it. Mm. And if you don't have enough of it, it manifests kind of like a, a masochist or a coward. Okay. Right. Okay. You're the one who's going to get picked on. You're not going to be assertive. You're going to be the one everyone's going to pick on. Right. You've got way too much warrior energy. It's going to manifest as sadism or it's going to manifest as 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 bullying. OK, mm. you're going to be abusive towards other people. And every one of these archetypes has these bipolar shadow forms where you got too much of the energy or too little of the energy. And what I found in the manosphere, particularly in the days when they were really pushing that sort of dark triad personality type, that this was the ideal uh, red-pilled man, you know, was narcissistic, Machiavellian, and psychopathic. <laughs> yeah. That was actually their ideal. You know, you don't wow. care. No emotional involvement. Have you ever noticed in the manosphere there's one word that's never appeared? It's the L word, love. Mm. They never talk about love. That's a great point. They never talk about, no, one-itis. Oh, he's starting to get feelings for her. Oh, better break it up quick before he, you know, he starts feeling something. God forbid we actually feel something for the people we're with, you know. But to go back, what I found was mm. that uh, a lot of the, the, uh, the, the, the dark triad personality types tracked exactly to the overinflated, three of the overinflated archetypes in Robert Moore's model. So psychopathy tracks exactly with too much warrior energy to the point of sadism. Uh, narcissism tracks to too much king energy, actually, to tyrannical selfish behavior. And Machiavellianism, Robert Moore almost exactly calls it that, detach manipulator, Machiavellian uh, over inflation, too much of his magician energy. And so what you find is the ideals of manosphere male personality are in fact dysfunctional shadow forms of authentically good human male potentials. And it's very curious, the one that they leave out, they leave out the lover archetype. That's so too true. Much, too much lover energy, addiction. Mm. The addicted love, any kind of addiction, way too much lover energy. And what underlies all of the manosphere considerations? Trying to get laid, trying to get women. And right. they don't talk about it, but $20 says that every one of those guys is looking at, <laughs> at, at uh, you know, embodying sort of their little dark triad. I'm, you know, the, the alpha male, according to the red pill uh, understanding, they're also addicted to sex. Right. Hide and right. watch. It's right there. 
which is addiction to a sort of dominance because uh, sexual dominance is one of those primitive form for a man to feel dominant. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and so when you're talking, what it reminded me of is I had a I had a idea for a stream called um, Exaggerated Masculinity. And I was going to talk a little bit about uh, the liver king, Aubrey Marcus, who's a sort of like a, a new agey leftist type guy at, at, over at On It with Joe Rogan okay. and, and Andrew Tate. And how they all have a sort of a different type of masculine uh, perspective or mm -hmm. energy, mm -hmm. um, and some and they all have good things, but in a way they're all sort of exaggerated in one way or another. So yeah. the Liver King, for example, it's all about being primal, primal, primal. So it has that sort of yeah. over over aggressive warrior spirit. Yeah. But uh, turns out he was lying the whole time to everybody's faith for multiple years about being on gear and all this different stuff. Which if you're on gear, that's fine. The point is. I've lost respect for you because you couldn't even be honest. The fact that everybody thinks you're on gear and you kept yeah. denying it for two years. Yeah. Um, yeah. And people that they thought that you were friends with you. Um, and so then you look at the opposite of that, like the Aubrey Marcus, when you're talking about love, I mean, he's getting down and like kissing women's feet to, to recognize the goddess in them and that mm. men, men need to stop becoming so masculine because it creates the ego and the dominator culture and all this different stuff. Well, this is, this is another exaggerated form. Yeah. And and a man is a, a little bit of all these things. Obviously, we need to be protective and aggressive to a certain degree, yeah. but that's all for something. And exactly. as you talked about, the absence of love is a disconnection with God, because why did God create creation for yeah. love, which yeah. is a personhood oriented understanding? We only can love other persons that can choose to love us back or choose not to love us back. Yes. And, and when you take Moore's masculine archetypes in their fullness the way they are they are best embodied and employed and and yeah employed the warrior protects what the village the women the children the old people the society you know he, he, he's a protector and goes out there and stands on the perimeter and takes it on the chin you know right. for the sake of everyone inside look at the icon of the nativity where is joseph he's in the bottom corner of the icon fighting with the devil taking it on the chin while mary and you know theotokos and christ are up there in the center okay look joseph is on the perimeter that's where he's supposed to be yeah. that's a beautiful subtle image in one of our icons of authentic orthodox warrior energy okay wow. that's what right. i've never heard that that's good yeah. that's good father I, I, I got a few more but that's <laughs> uh you know the lover in his fullness is full of concern and compassion, you know, for the other. The war or the magician in his fullness is all about esoteric knowledge, technology, and all in service of adding value and providing insight for what, for whom, for everyone around them. And the king in his fullness is not a tyrant and selfish. He's the generative one. He's the one who takes care of his kingdom. He's the one who takes care of his people, who sees everybody else in the, you know, in the in the courtroom, who bestows gifts and recognition and honors you know, to other people. Perfect example. Have me on sometime. I will explain the Lion King all in terms of, of Moore's four male archetypes. It's all there. It's all perfect. Go back and rewatch the Lion King. Uh, ignore the circle of life bullshit, but for the rest of it, <laughs> okay. yeah, I love that. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, the exaggerated masculinity is, as I, I mentioned to you privately, as I ask, uh, I, I've, again, I've done a debate with a pickup artist and I've asked some of my friends, uh, people that I, I talk with and do streams with that aren't explicitly religious or just make no claim on, on God or anything like that, is I ask them, like, what are you willing to die for? Because I think that's a huge part of what it means to be a man, uh, because what I'm willing to die for is tied to everything that I love. It's tied to what I believe to be true. It's tied to, to my own self identity and it gives me purpose and it gives me a reason. And I, I we've, you know, anyways, the, the Orthodox church and, and, or, you know, our faith, Christianity provides us something to care for. And then that's what God wants us to do. The whole point of Christ, again, using him as the image of our masculinity is He's there to serve other people. I mean, how it says multiple times in Scripture, uh, you know, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Yes, and, and underscore that a little bit more. That verse comes at the very end 
of all of Christ's teachings and miracles in the three synoptic gospels. Immediately after that verse, Matthew, Mark, and Luke turn their attention exclusively to the passion, death, and resurrection. That is the summary verse in the synoptic gospels for what Christ was saying. It's big, it's, mm. it's bigger than what you said. Wow. The son of man came not to be served, but to serve. And right. I think that, you know, for Christian manhood, that's what we do, which means we need to have something with which we can serve, but also our attention is off ourselves. And we got two great commandments. What do you do? Love God and love your neighbor. They take your right. attention off yourself. Okay. Right. Serve God, serve your neighbor, you know, and that doesn't mean, you know, live in abject, you know, asceticism and, 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 and being deprived of everything, but it means developing your own self, your gifts, working on your talents enough to where you have enough to provide for yourself and for everyone else around you. In fact, I was struck. I've been doing a number of weddings this year, I've, more than I've ever done in a single year. And Glory so to God. Passage, yeah, thank God. There's like seven or eight, I think, this year. It's it's, it's wow. wonderful. But there is a line in the marriage service in the three long prayers, you know, they're right before the crowning, where it says, you know, uh, you know, give them, O Lord, of the fatness of the earth, you know, fill their garners with wheat, wine, and oil, so that having enough of all good things, they may in turn give to those in need. Mm. There it is. Provide for this couple, give them everything they need and more so that, again, like I said with masculinity, having received everything from God, they can be grateful and they can turn around and share their gifts with everyone around them. Right. And that's really why we idolize certain men. So whether it be LeBron James or, uh, you know, uh, Max, was it uh, General Maximus from uh, the, the movie The Gladiator? Yeah. It, it, it's like what it. Yes, yeah, it's, it's individual feats that contribute to a collective cause is why men are venerated. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter if you're in the Coliseum, if you're you know playing basketball or you're a great uh, NFL quarterback, you know, Tom Brady. It's that he developed through discipline, personal excellence, that all the fans, the whole team, all these other people are contributed to a singular cause. And that a single man was able to serve the attainment of that cause is why then people idolize and look up to and revere certain men. And so it's right there in our secular culture is why are, why are the sports athletes revered the most? It's because... There's so many fans that they are contributing to a collective effervescence, as Durkheim yeah. talks about, of a feeling of achievement. Yes. And he helps us all attain, again, whatever feat it is, but he helps the collectivity achieve the goals together. And that that is why we still revere those men. Yeah. They live and, in some cases, die for something much bigger than themselves. And, alas, we have fewer things nowadays for which uh, uh, men are willing to die. You know, I, right. I remember, what was that old Latin phrase? Uh, dulce decorum es pro patria mori. How sweet and decorous it is to die for your fatherland. That ties I, into, that ties I, exactly into something I wanted to talk to you about, which was patriotism. Tomorrow yeah, we're going to be welcome for the segue. Yeah, that was perfect, Father. That was perfect. I'm so glad I set you up for that, or, or at least we talked about it previously. That was, that was phenomenal. But as I said privately, I wanted to talk to you about patriotism because as Orthodox Christians, and correct me if I'm wrong, but to be Orthodox, again, the reason why there's a Bulgarian and there's a Serbian and there's a Russian and there's a Greek church is that the unique differences and peoples that God has made are to be celebrated and brought together in Christ and the church. And so we celebrate the distinction, but we come together uh, as the body of Christ. And it means, and it, it's tied to patriotism. To be a patriot is to stand up for the fatherland, yes, you know, the, the patriarchy. Yeah. And so we're getting ready to celebrate Fourth of July tomorrow, and it's very common for again the young men that are also converting to orthodoxy, as we talked about at the beginning of this conversation, is this absolute over veneration then of Russia. And how America then, everything that's wrong in the world has to do with America, 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 American people, American people are terrible. And then they themselves are American. Yeah. And I agree. I, you know, I can see all the ills with our country and what we're doing and whether it be the administration or the politics or the, you know, military industrial complex agreed. But 
it's essential to be a man. I don't see how you can be a man disassociated from the land and the peoples and the men that came before you. And so somehow as Orthodox men, we need to be able to recover a sense of patriotism, whether we're in the West, whether you're in the UK or America or you're in Germany and you become Orthodox, that that has to be part of, again, what it be what it means to be Orthodox, but what it means to be a man and, and bringing all this stuff together. What, what are your thoughts on that? Wow. Um, varied and, and scattered. Um, <laughs> no, but I, 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 I get it. And I think, uh, full disclosure, you know, I'm, I'm a native Texan. You know, my, my, my mother, my mother is Jeez, president. You're all up in Michigan, I'm, huh? My, yeah, well, I, I married a Yankee. So I ended up, <laughs> that, that's what happens. You marry a Yankee, you end up in the North. So just guys take warning. All right. Um, <laughs> But my my people have been there since the days of the Republic. My mother is the president of the Daughters of the Republic of Texas. Okay, so you know the Texas pride runs very deep in me. And my wife laughs. She's she's from Michigan. That's that's why we're here. Uh, but my wife laughs. You know that I, I I sort of like on King of the Hill. I talk about Texas in the U.S. And if Texas ever declared its independence, I would be very hard pressed to stay put. <laughs> I think, you know, if I needed to, to dig a trench with one hand and hold a shotgun in another to protect Texas, I understand that sentiment. Mm -hmm. There is, a, I, I have a deep sense of place and a deep sense of belonging, and I, I, I miss being there. You know, in a way, I'm not ready to pull up stakes and you know, and 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 move back to Texas, but. There is a, a deep sense of place, which I which I have. It helps me to understand, for example, immigrants into the church who really want to maintain their ethnic ties and their language and their culture and all, because that is so important to us. It gives texture right. and form and structure to our lives. You right. know, the sort of the sort of deracinated, uprooted cosmopolitanism uh, that where people have no roots, they have no loyalty to place. Uh, 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 or to a people or to anything, uh, I, I don't think is is the healthiest way to be. So I, I agree with you that there is there there. I think there is a place for patriotism and orthodoxy. Uh, Christ did tell us to preach the gospel to all nations, mm -hmm. not to all individuals. I, I don't you know. Just as you say that, I, I remember that verse. I don't know. You know how hard I want to massage that text right. in order to, you know, to to absolutize something there. I, I I don't know what to think about it, but it just came to my mind, you know, as you were saying that. So I think, and there are angels assigned to different nations as well. So somehow, nations have something. There there's something in God's plan. There is a place for them. Um, and yeah, I I I kind of I kind of get it. Look, I, I'm sort of with you. I'm I'm very disappointed in my own country right now and the politics and the society. There there's quite a lot that is rotten here, but that right. doesn't that doesn't obscure everything that is good. And I don't think it's beyond repair. And I think I do what I can within my sphere in order to make things better. I, I can't affect anything on the national level. I don't even watch the damn news anymore. I don't watch the the local news except right. for the weather anymore. Either. Because first, all it does is it gets my anxiety up and it upsets me. And it's about stuff that I can't do anything about anyway. Right. So as the French say, je cultive mon petit jardin. I take care of my own little garden. I take care that I raise, I, I protect my wife and that I raise my sons well. And I try to preach the gospel to my congregation and to lead them well so that they can lead good and Christian lives. And like I, I've become very fond of saying so that they can go and be a blessing to the people around them. Right. And I think when we serve, it's like that parable of the, you know, the yeast or the leaven hidden in the in the lump. You know, the, the whole world doesn't have to be Christian for Christians to have a, a significant and sub, substantive influence on it. You know, all it takes is a little bit of yeast to leaven the whole dough. And mm -hmm. if we as Christians can live as good lives, that we can pray for the world. And prayer is not nothing. It's really not. It's, it's quite powerful. Right. We pray for the world. If we can be charitable to our neighbor, if we can be kind even to even to those who hate us, you know, like we sing, you know, and forgive all by the resurrection. We just quit singing that, you know, at Pentecost. You know? <laughs> if we can do that kind of a thing, we can have our effect. And uh, yeah, I'm planted here. 
uh, in a Detroit suburb, which I never imagined in all my years that I would <laughs> end up here, but here I am. So I take it, I say, yes, sir, this is where I, you know, this is where I have my station, where I do my thing. And right. so I try to affect the world to the degree that I can here. Right. I, I And something that changed my perspective a little bit, or at least something that I've been wrestling with, was... Uh, my fiance, uh, we, she wanted me to look into like the history of my family lineage. And so I did a pretty deep dive for like a week looking into everything. And I saw that, uh, both my mom and my dad's side basically, uh, got to England right after the Norman conquest. So right around that 12th century mm -hmm. period, uh, mother's side comes from Germany and Scotland. Father's side, uh, is like, uh, Northern France. Mm -hmm. So so English for many, many generations, uh, many centuries. And then I found that both of them came to America, my father's side in the late 1600s and my mother's side around the 1740s to 60s. Okay. And so I was like, wow. So both my family. You found all that in one week? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. Wow. So my, my uh, mother I, is a, prof I'm a, my mother is a professional genealogist. You know, she's been working on our, our history for you know longer than I've been alive. Well, what helped me is my mom, my on my mother's side, they, the family had already written a book that goes back to uh, when they had left Hamburg, Germany. Okay. So so the family left somewhere. They're not sure where, but uh, the general understanding was Hamburg. And then they left for England. But anyways, the point the point being that I found that both my family lines were actually here before the revolution. And that gave me just a different sense of my relationship to America, even though I get it. Uh, again, the Orthodox, we, we promote monarchy and the idea that it was the revolution was again, you know, these Masonic people were fighting against the, the monarchy in England, all this different stuff. But it led me to think about, man, I'm, I'm about as American as you could get. Mm -hmm. And, um, that, and then seeing that how many generations I'm here in Indiana and my family's been in the Kentucky, Indiana for many, many generations. And so it's like, man, even though there's so much wrong with the country, it gave me a sense of patriotism in regards to the people, my people, my culture. And when I went to Germany, when I travel, I didn't think about this when I was in East Asia during my 20s. But, you know, going and spending time, my fiance is German. So uh, spending time with her family. I can't get rid of the, you know, where I come from, me being a Hoosier, the language, the the way I speak English, my thoughts, my experiences. This stuff is it, it is who I am. Yes. And 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 orthodoxy, I see, is allowing me to sanctify the American inside of me yes. and present it as an I'm an American Orthodox man. And I want to I want to live up to that to the best of my abilities. And and so. Now, when you know July Fourth tomorrow, I have a, a little bit of a different appreciation for the opportunity that the that that the country and, and history has afforded me because it's all providence, and that's how I look at it. My parents, my family, where I'm at today, it's all providence. God has put us here, and I yeah, and you know whether you think for a reason or not. Um, as you say that, and as I glance at at uh, some of the comments in the chat. Um, yeah, there's a lot that is wrong with the country. And what comes to mind, and I recommend this to everyone who's watching, go back and read the prayer of the three young children uh, in the fiery furnace in the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. And the reason I recommend it is because at the very beginning of their prayer, they don't pray for themselves. They pray for all of Israel. We have done wrong. We have done evil. We have departed from your ways. We have done pretty much everything wrong. That is to say, the three children in the fiery furnace took on themselves the sins of their entire nation and asked God's forgiveness and repented of it and gave voice to that. Right. And I think that if we don't like the direction of our country, then perhaps we might do the same thing. Because like you say, we are Americans, willy-nilly, whether we like it or not, here we are, and that's who we are. Right. So if we can lift up and say, 
Lord, you gave us a great thing, and we have mucked it up royally, and we have done evil, and we have oppressed the poor, and we have not lived according to your commandments, and we have squandered the riches which you have given to us, but in, in the goodness of your heart, have mercy on us. Set us on a better path. I think that's probably a rather powerful prayer. And right. I think it's also a way out of the sort of general despair and nihilism that uh, I so often see in younger people. Yeah. And I want to bring up this super chat because it ties with what we're talking about. And my dad, I grew up, my dad was a former helicopter pilot in the army. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with a lot of the military rhetoric and patriotism in that way. And then in my 20s, you know, the rebellion. I was, you know, I, everything that was wrong with America is the only thing that I saw. Yeah. And, um, and I, you know, in 2023, my dad has eventually got to the point where he sees the degeneracy of our country and how it's infiltrated the military. And so I almost went to the military after high school, but the, and, and this is going to be tied to the super chat. I mean, would I send my son to go into the U S military and die for the military industrial complex today? Absolutely not. And I, and I think you can still be a patriot and also still feel it that way about the country. But Ga uh, Gabriel Incel uh, says, uh, Insle Benitez throws in 499, says, my priest and I are both in the army. He says Orthodox men should serve in the military to be a good influence against the woke agenda. Any thoughts? Um, if you have the strength of faith and strength of mind in order to stand against it, and to pay the price for standing against it. I think maybe you can do that. I don't know that. Uh, well, I, I, I don't know you, Gabriel, so maybe you do. God bless you if you do. Um, there are consequences to be willing to stand against uh, the flow of the culture. Um, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I remember one of my favorite quotations from old Archbishop Fulton Sheen, if I can quote a Catholic archbishop on an Orthodox channel. He said one time, dead bodies float downstream. It takes live bodies to resist the current. And I think he's absolutely right. So we're able to resist the current well and good. Uh, you know, but you, you are setting yourself up to be a target or you're painting a target on your back. So if you go in knowing that and you're willing to pay the price for it, well and good. Um, individuals able to stand up to the overwhelming woke agenda i i i don't know i, I don't know that that's very effective uh or argue otherwise i mean I, you know that's that's just sort of my surmise but i think my impression is you probably get steamrolled uh like i say if you can stand up to it god bless you you know we need right. more that can but you know even in the early church just you know, riffing on that a little bit. I remember St. Cyprian of Carthage in the days of the Roman persecutions, you know, they told the Christians, do not go up to Roman soldiers and tell them that you're Christian. You know, if you don't have the strength to, to withstand martyrdom, run away when you know that the army is coming to your town or to your village. Don't put yourself in harm's way because the chances that you're going to deny Christ are too high. Then where are you? You know, better to run away than to deny Christ and lose your soul. Right. So, you know, you're probably not going to have to deny Christ being in the army, but, you know, you boot it out or, you know, God knows God knows what else they can do to you. Right. Well, you have to be for OK according to the for not playing according to the to the rules. Yeah, I, well, you have to be OK with that. Your military commander may be a man who dresses like a woman and goes by female pronouns. I mean, yeah. we just let the U.S. Army, one of their uh, intel commanders is they were celebrating was a man who goes by he, her, who's, you know, uh, I would say a sexual degenerate in one way or another. But um I, I sympathize with Gabriel and thank God that brother that you're, you're in the military. And so was your priest. God bless you both. Bear I wish witness. You yeah. Bear witness as best you can, you know, and, and here is where, um, <clears throat> well, I quoted Archbishop Fulton Sheen. I can quote Martin Luther too. <laughs> here I can stand. I can do no other, you know, and, you know, take your lumps for, for bearing witness to your faith. God bless you. If you, if you can do it. Yeah. And, what I would worry about is people in the chat of highlight is if you are part of the military is some of the medical procedures, especially that were pushed in 2021 after 2020, 
that uh, are, are obviously ineffective and tied to detrimental uh, consequences with one's health. Um, you know, it's just where I'm, it's like, oh, that's where I'm thinking. It's, it's something I'm wrestling with this whole patriotism. How can I celebrate America, recognize all these shortcomings and still be, feel that connection and that, that uh, lineage with the men before me and correct it. That's where can, I see. Well, I think we can, I think we can do that. I don't here. Correct me if I'm wrong. I do like you say, this is sort of, I haven't really thought this through. But I think in the same way that we can celebrate our dad's birthday, knowing all of his flaws and blemishes. <laughs> yeah. You know? Okay. Mm -hmm. The country ain't great. I hate the direction it's going in right now, but, you know, you know, by God, it's mine. You know? Right. So, and I know what it can be. And I have seen it in, you know, in, in, in glory. I have seen it at its best. You know, and there, and I, well, I've been around 62 years, so I've, I've seen some really excellent, you know, moments in, in, in recent American history. I know what we're capable of. And right. you know, God, God for, well, I don't know. I was about to say, God forbid that it requires a crisis so deep that we have to, that we have to uh, uh, pull ourselves out of some of the moral ambiguities that we're playing around with. You know, I, I, I think, you know, a, a lot of the stuff that's on the news nowadays is there only because we've really got it so good that we can actually worry about pronouns. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, I, I don't, I don't think they're worrying about pronouns on the front lines in Ukraine or, you know, or in the Middle East or in most of the rest of the world. They don't have time for that shit. You know, and the fact that we do probably is hiding the fact that we've got it pretty cushy right now. Right, and it definitely is, and that's the nature. You look at the history of nations; decadence has always been one that leads to to the degeneration of nation states yeah. and you could say feminizing effects on men and that we look at our secular culture there's no doubt that again this hedonism this this pursuit for serotonin and dopamine hits this is a feminizing process and whether it's the neoteny that we're not allowed to or we're not in an environment that we can mature in the same way or the feminizing effects of our culture. I mean, all this stuff is absolutely detrimental to masculinity. Yeah, I, I think it is. And the um, I've done best in my life when I had to work the hardest. You know, re really looking back, looking back at it, when I really had to bust my ass in graduate school and finish a dissertation under a time crunch. Um, you know, when I've worked with coaches um, uh, for different things, but when I've really had to push myself hard. And I, I think this is true. I think I think men are at our, our, our men are at our best when we find our edge and we live right there. Right. We live right there at the edge, pushing it just a little bit. You know, I, I forget my source, but I, I say it frequently. Lean into your fear and push your edge. Mm. And when we can find that edge, that's where we're white hot. And it's marvelous. In fact, uh, if someone finds me on uh, on Instagram or, or TikTok, the post I put up today was, in fact, a quotation from Charles Bukowski, mm. where he talks about that. He says, you know, if you're going to try, go all the way, because then when you push yourself all the way through, you know, you will be there. You know, the nights will flame with fire and there is no better feeling on earth than when you've thrown yourself fully into something. And you probably experienced the same yourself. And it's right. a glorious thing, you know, for right. us to do that. Uh, but we don't typically do that because nothing's required of us. Nothing draws us out. Um, women don't demand much of their men or men resent it when their women, you know, demand something of them. Uh, society doesn't really demand anything of us except that we consume, you know, the latest curated goods that uh, we're supposed to consume. Right. Uh, and that's why we very often end up having to push ourselves and why a good brotherhood, as you said earlier, you know, the company of other men who can be around us, who can say, you're slacking, you've got more in you, you know, step, step up to it, man up, you know, listen, distinction. When men tell you to man up, it's because they see in you a potential that you're not living up to and that you right. can do better. And your detriment to other men. And I mean, your detriment weak men to, are detrimental. Yeah, you're you're, you're going to cost us something if you don't step up. Right. 
and and very that often nowadays very often nowadays if women tell a man to man up it's do what i want you to do not right you know not grow into your excellence or your you know, right. your optimum so yeah alas you know you have to listen to the source on that but when a man tells you come on guy man up you know right. you, you you got more we see potential in you and you're not living up to it if you have guys in your in your life that can do that for you you're golden right you really are, you're golden yeah, I, I am a bit jealous of some of my Russian and Serbian friends um, that can have such a proud patriotism of their country because one, they enjoy the the direction that they're going. They feel like their leaders have the best interest of the community. And I think it breeds a, a sense of masculinity that we in the West have are so global, so consumeristic, so self-focused. Hmm. That uh, we we don't have that that spirit that sense of uh, compatriotism like yeah. like some of our other nations and and yeah and so you I know, they are they are also they are also much smaller and homogeneous right you know which genuinely helps yeah absolutely you know, yeah America is yeah. not like that you know we can we can cry tears over that if we want to but it's that's not the reality of it we're a, a huge multicultural. Oh, uh, there he is. Consume, obey, and conform. Right. And, yeah. and that is the modern man. This is the man who hasn't even probably stepped into the manosphere, at least the conversation that George was talking about, a masculinity is the consumerism as we get. A, this actually is a callback to the beginning of our conversation. What did you say when I asked you what was a man? You said one that produces more than he consumes. Yes. Yes. And, and we and, live and in an we live in a culture where there's just constant consumers, constant pleasing of my think, hedonistic senses. Think how, yeah, think how dehumanizing this is to reduce a human person made in the image and likeness of God to a consumer. I find it vulgar, vulgar almost, almost to the point of contempt. I hate right. the term to be called a consumer, that I am nothing but my desires and what I'm willing to pay for and eat. Right. Yeah, it, 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 it's 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 unspeakable. It really is. And a consumer, as as George says, I mean, they're going to do what they need to do to consume. And that was, again, just potentially looking at potential medical practices that were pushed. How many people were willing to do something they didn't want to do for the convenience of what it allowed them to do? It allowed them to go back to the mall. They could go buy the latest Nikes or do it. This is weakness and a man right. whose main focus is the consumption of products or brands. And this is where I would say even rap culture, hip hop culture, the idea, you know, you got to wear the Gucci and you got to have the, the Louis Vuitton. And it th this is effeminate. This is not masculine. A masculine man is not so concerned with a brand. I don't want to be branded by things. Mm -hmm. I deliberately. So this is I do not wear logos. None mm -hmm. of my clothes. And I. I make sure when I buy things, yeah, that's nice quality, but I don't want any logo because I'm not a billboard for these, for these corporations. Yeah. And, um, if you're a consumer, you're going to obey and you're going to conform. And we saw this and we still see this, that the people who have left of center values are the most likely to obey and conform and consume because the entire infrastructure, this inverted, uh, system that we're a part of, provides them the, the consumption and the hedonism and the pleasure seeking that they want. And then, so they just go along with it. Yes. Yeah. Just as you say, that reminds me, what was the old saying? If you drink the King's ale, you must dance to the King's jig. Oh, I, that's a good one. You know, yeah, that, that's an old one, you know, but, but there it is. And uh, yeah, you're uh, saying, I'm sorry. I was thinking of two things. You had another point there that I would, it, it, just that the the consumerism, I mean, the people that are left of center are going to obey and conform because the entire structure itself, what they deem mm -hmm. as the authority, uh, it, it, it reinforces the yes. behavior patterns, the ideology, um, every, you know, just in obviously orthodoxy, oh. we try to stay out of politics. But if you're orthodox, oh. it's going to put you somewhere well, on the spectrum. Yeah, do you, do you remember, um, I don't know if you remember, you were probably too young for it, but you maybe seen the book. It's, it's been out of print for uh, 10, 20 years. It was Saint. Uh, it was come out of Platina. Uh, it's called The Last True Rebellion. Did you ever see that book? Mm -mm. Yeah, it was sort of, uh, They. this was when they had uh, the beginning of the punks to monks 
uh, phenomena. They had some young men in sort of California punk culture who found orthodoxy and became monks at, at St. Uh, Herman's in Platina. Oh. And they were the ones who started that that zine. I forget what it's Death to the World. You know, there's still some copies of that. I think they're on social media now too. Uh, that I'm sort familiar of, with Death to the World. Yeah, yeah. You know that 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 whole kind of uh, aesthetic, you know, which uh, really appeals to a certain segment of of young male Orthodox population. <laughs> yeah. uh, but one of the original books was was called The Last True Rebellion, and what they said was, yeah, we were trying to rebel against society. We hated the way the world was going, so we numbed out with drugs and we tried to lose ourselves in sex. You know, we you know, and we and and, and we got drunk all of the time, and it was never enough. And then ultimately, they found Christ, and they said, you really want to rebel against the world? Follow Christ. You know, and. What do we have inherent in orthodoxy? This fine ascetical tradition where we minimize our consumption, right? Where we fast, you know, where we spend our time, you know, quietly in prayer rather than in front of a screen, right? Uh, and I think so, you know, with, without, with with simply picking up and using the tradition as we have received it, it's sufficient to take us out of some of the worst aspects of the world. And I mean, I forget which one is. And one of the Desert Fathers described our life in the world. This is how do, how is it, Father, that we are supposed to be in the world but not of the world? Mm -hmm. And he says, "You be like a wheel that only touches the ground, only touches the earth at one little point. The rest of it is always up." Oh, wow. it's, it's a lovely image, isn't it? I love yeah. that. Touch the world as lightly as as you need to. And a wheel is functional. It it moves. Oh. It moves, it, 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 it's yeah. productive, it's doing something good, but it only touches the ground at one little point. And so if we can do that... I'm going to steal... I'll, I'll give you credit, hey, but I'm going to steal it, that one. It, it belongs to the Holy Fathers. It's not okay. your yeah. mind. Yeah, yeah, it belongs to the Holy Fathers. You can have that. Because it's all, uh, it belongs to all of us. Yeah, I love uh, that. But that's that's a nice way to live and, and to hold all of the rest of it lightly. You know, because sometimes you know, we, we hold on too tightly to some of these things. And, and that right. holding on to anything too tightly is generally where you get into trouble. Right. And and I this actually I was getting ready to say the same thing. George already beat me to it. But that's one of the things that I think is so appealing about orthodoxy is to be a, actually a traditional Christian and to be orthodox. I can't think of something more counterculture. If you really want to be counterculture, if you really want to push the edge, then be an orthodox Christian and oh, actually yeah. be believing and you're going to be already, if you adopt that phronema, you're already against the 90% of what we're up against in the world. Oh, yeah. You want to be first? Be last. You want to be powerful? Be weak. You know, you want to be master? Be the servant of everybody. Start there. Right. Wow. Yeah. 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 And that paradox, that's what I love about orthodoxy. But that paradox, if I'm willing to submit myself to Christ, you see, then, I, then I don't. I'm. There's nobody in this world that I'm going to submit to. Yeah. There's no. I'm not going to fall victim to this over uh, veneration that I'm seeing of whatever it be, American culture. You know, oh, it's it's dissent. Trump's going to get us out of it. He's going to he's going to drain the swamp or whoever it is. You know, uh, the, yeah, the third Rome country. in Moscow, and Putin's going to save save the world. He's going to defend or whatever it is. All this stuff is a scapegoating. This is a lack of maturation. The only person I submit to is Christ in the church. Mm -hmm. From there, that allows me to be a man of actual um, ability to not conform, to be, uh, you know, to use a metaphor, erect, standing strong in the mm -hmm. world, being virile, being a man, being masculine, having something, again, it gets back to having something you're willing to die for, is once I again, once orthodoxy about probably about a year, year and a half after I got brought into the church, once it finally got in my heart, mm -hmm. yeah, I know. Um, yeah, it was such a relief that there's nothing the world can take from me. Yeah. You know, cause I was worried, especially when 2020 I was brought into the church and I was thinking about, Oh, how am I going to find a wife? How am I going to buy a house? How am I going to finish this PhD? What am I going to do? How am I going to take care or, you know, take care of my family and, and make sure that they're going to be all safe. And it just had all this anxiety about how am I going to do it? How am I going to do it? And then eventually as that relationship with God gets deeper and you see that Providence is all around you, that he's never left you, that it's really, you know, the, the hindrance is my own heart and me. It's like eventually I got to a place where I can just let go of that 
in that relationship with God allows me to do all those other things. Yes. What was that? Didn't we didn't didn't uh, didn't we preach on that or hear that in in church just yesterday? Seek first the kingdom of God and all these yep. things shall be added unto you. Yep. My house synchronicity. Well, the world calls it synchronicity. We'll call it yeah. grace. Yeah. It's so true, though. And uh, and that's what gets back to, again, like you I don't think you can be a man until you really have something. And this is again and maybe I'm wrong, but this is speaking from my own growth and how I feel about myself is that I really wasn't a man until I had something that was a clear line that I'm willing to die for, you know, and people were talking about, oh, we're the mask, the hill you're going to die on or the jabs, the, the hill you're going to die on. No, the hill I'm going to die on is the Orthodox Church. Mm. And and we talked, I talked about this at Montanica with Bishop Maxime was there of the Serbian mm. jurisdiction, multiple priests were there of different jurisdictions. But uh, me and Father Turbo were talking about how orthodoxy provides us a perimeter. And men then, once we in the church and we have that relationship with God, we can get on that perimeter and we can face the world. The women and children can come inside that church and they can be safe and they can do what God has blessed them, the gifts of femininity, the gifts of being able to nurture. They can do that inside the church. But us men, we can get in there and then we can we can take our position on the perimeter and we take no step back. That, we yeah. don't we don't we don't attack people, but no. we never, ever, ever take a step back from that perimeter and what the church has defined. And, and the fact that the Church of Christ still exists in twenty twenty three. If you really believe in Christ, what's the most powerful thing you could do other than live that life and not back down? Yeah. And just, you know, you're absolutely right. And that is precisely warrior energy. That's the warrior archetype. And thank God we have military saints as well. Right. But you're absolutely right. So, yeah, once again, back to the icon of nativity. And there's Joseph on the perimeter wrestling with the devil and keeping his woman and his child safe. Right. There it is. Perfect image of Christian manhood right there. Not right. the Catholic Holy Family business. Joseph out on the perimeter, dealing with dealing with the problems, taking care, taking care of business, saying, I got this. And he does have it. Right. I love that during your conversation with Bedros, that a woman loves when you say these three words oh, yeah. and you, you set it up. So everybody thought you're going to say, I love you. But you said, I got this. I got. I this. love that. Could you speak a little bit to uh, unpack that? Why? Why does a woman love when a man says, "I got this"? And how does that relate to a man being a man? Uh, because it has to do with with providing and protecting. Uh, women want their men to know what they're doing. They want, as we said earlier, competence. Okay, and very often, uh, I, I I I found this. Women tend to be a little more fearful than men are. I mean, I, I even watch my my wife, you know, will will we'll exit a building or a store or a restaurant or something. And the way she'll hold her purse, you know, put the strap over her head and put her purse under her arm and, you know, and all just or going out into a parking lot. Uh, you know, I see it. They, they tend to be a little more fearful than, than, than men are. And, you know, when men can step up and, and, and take care of business, when we can do the man stuff that we're supposed to do, whether it's a flat tire or the spider in the kitchen or whatever it is, it allows, it allows women to relax into their femininity a little more. Where when men can take care of, of, of their business then with, so that women don't have to do that, they're really much happier. And so when you can say, babe, I got this. Don't worry about it. It's an incredible relief to them. And sometimes, you know, we, we talked earlier, you said, yes, you know, men provide, especially like standing on the perimeters of the village or whatnot, we provide safety so that the women can perform their function, so that they can be nurturing, so that they can be caring, uh, so that they can be creative in the way that women are. But it's so that's what men do for women. But women also call out of men some of the, our, our best masculine qualities, you know, damsel right. in distress, help, help, you know, right. when sweet Polly is in trouble, I am not slow, you know, <laughs> underdog, you know, right, right. <laughs> you know, but they do, they call out or from Popeye. Yeah, Popeye. Right. yeah. I mean, it's all of those, all of those things, you know, uh, you know, and it's, yeah, sometimes it's, it's gross and manipulative, but very often men want to 
step up and provide. They want to step up and protect. They want to feel masculine and women can call those qualities out of us if we're given the opportunity, if they're given the opportunity to do so. And right. so really when a man can simply take care of stuff, say, babe, I got this. Um, right. They relax so much and it's one less thing on their plate and it reduces their anxiety. And you know, if you've, if you've been around anxious women, uh, if we can reduce their anxiety, it's a great blessing to the rest of us. Right. I have some in my parish. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, while you're speaking, uh, and, and we mentioned this last time when we talked, again, I use this metaphor, and I guarantee you the people watching are tired of me reiterating it, but men are the castle walls and women and children are the jewels within. And so as yep. men stand erect, again, getting back to that perimeter metaphor, yep. um, we can protect the things that are most valuable to us. Yes. And so it's not that men protecting is demeaning of women and children. It's elevating no. them to demonstrate yeah. that they're the most valuable thing. Exactly. And so as men have become more feminized and those walls, those defining boundaries in society have eroded, the government has taken over control. And so we can look back to, you know, uh, the 1960s and the idea of welfare and getting, you know, certain communities in the United States to to have children but not be married and make sure the man doesn't live with the woman and then the government will give them money. Well, the man's there to protect and provide. And so we've seen that the government, society, the inverted authority structures that is, they are taking the man, removing him from a domain as you talked about that relationship with a woman that allows him to mature. Yes. Putting the woman then in a relationship where basically she's married to the state. And if she's married to the state and the state's giving her money, the state's protecting her. And then the state is now defining the boundaries. You know, I believe mm -hmm. it. your state of Michigan just tried to pass something. I don't know if it got passed, but five years in prison for misgendering. And so I the, don't know. the state is yeah. now trying to redefine the boundaries of order in society. And this is because the men have been emasculated and they have they are not doing the duty that they that they function as in society. Uh, and and when you say that, you know, say it and, and imply no blame in that. You know, it's not that all oh, men have failed to step up. And a lot of times it's been taken away from us uh, or we've not been taught or we've been rebuked. Uh, when we've tried to exercise those things uh, again, I've I've become rather, you know, rather sensitive to to blaming men uh, for stuff. Not to say that we don't bear blame, but let's you know let's do it in an orthodox way. Let me accuse myself. Let me see my own transgressions and not judge my brother. Uh, but you know, when I say when when I want to protect and provide for my for my wife, you know, if the state has already stepped in, or if I am not able, you know, to find an adequate job. For whatever reason and i cannot do the things that i need to do well thank god there's a safety net but you know to rely on that and to allow it to take over you're right then what then i have no purpose and as i said near the beginning of our talk having a a, a, a substantial meaningful responsibility and a purpose in life is one of the things that helps grow a man up and that gives us the greatest satisfaction in life is knowing that that our lives matter that there's something meaningful that we're doing and contributing and if that's taken away from us, if we can't even provide for our own families, yeah, right. it contributes mightily to the, you know, to the malaise that men are suffering from. Right. That's the masculine energy in society is being transported from individual men to the state. And, and I think, I think we can see that as a general progression since the sixties and somebody mentions here, uh, you know, well, most most men make forty to fifty thousand, and women don't like that deal. Well, why is it that women are only looking at men for the amount of money they make? And that is then again this ripple effect that we're trying to highlight here. That well, in part, in beca part because what we've said without any sort of controversy so far is that men are expected to provide. You right. know, and as I said, you know, and and I I, I guessed I, I I wasn't watching the chat to see if there was any disagreement. Yes, as men pro provide more than they consume. It's kind of what we're supposed to do. And right. I don't know about, you know, your experience, but uh, my experience uh, was when uh, m my wife has a Bachelor of Science degree in medical technology. Uh, we met in a hospital lab. I was drawing blood. I was a lowly phlebotomist. She was a med tech. 
she made two or three times more than what I made. When we married, she made more than I did. Certainly when I was ordained a priest, she made more than I did, you know, for about half of my priesthood. And that lay as a burden on my heart. You know, how am I supposed to be providing for my wife when, you know, there was even, I mean, backhanded blessings, sort of. You know, I happened right. to be working part time when each of my two sons were born. And it was cheaper for me just to quit work and raise my boys than it was to try to put them in daycare. So, you know, I, I got to raise my sons when they were infants, but, you know, we had a full role reversal. My wife went off to the hospital to work every day and I was a house husband, you know? And yeah, we made it work because we had to, but I did not like that at all. And it, it injured my own sense of pride, you know, and until the day that, that you know, uh, I was able to grow my last parish enough to where they could provide a salary for me, uh, that I made at least what my wife made. I felt this sort of cloud of, of inadequacy or that somehow I had failed. And I hadn't really. I mean, we were both doing the best that we could and we were contributing and, you know, we were both raising the kids and all of that. And thank God they turned out okay. Uh, you know, but still there's sort of that, you know, that, that expectation. And whether it's right or wrong, this is sort of what men live under. You know, and we do that. And, you know, even not just providing, but even protecting. You may remember this was brought up, uh, one of the mass shootings. I, I forget where it was. I think it was maybe the one in um, uh, Las Vegas. It said, the gun bullets started flying and when people realized someone was shooting at us. You know, all of the boyfriends and the husbands grabbed their wives and girlfriends, threw them to the ground and lay on top of them to protect them from the bullets. They didn't think about that. I mean, that was that was spontaneous. That's what men do. We are hardwired for that, you know. And so there are a lot of you know a lot of these things we talk about. Like they're you know they're they're not just this this is where society lies to us a bit. They're not just cultural norms, you know, uh, that we adopt now. And oh, let's just redefine masculinity again for the you know for the next decade. I'm old enough to where we've been redefining masculinity every decade for the last damn 50 years and yeah. it's been nothing but a but a dumpster fire every time they try it right uh, it has objective qualities we've talked about some of those things it's right. grounded in natural law it is grounded in biology you know it's, it's grounded in these fundamental things that men do right you know, protect provide preside and procreate you know Good. and we cannot get away from those sorts of things right and we're miserable when we try I was wondering so if you could. Are women. They're miserable too. They are, and and we, we look. I mean that that's a that's a. Uh, again, I agree with the manosphere of one hundred percent. When you look at the health of women today, every decade they take more and more and more psychotic drugs. Mm -hmm. they the depression of the levels of depression go more and more up. So the more independent they are, the more feminized our society is. The more men are out of the picture, women's mental health deteriorates more because, and more yeah. and more. And it correlates, I won't say cause, but it correlates also with assuming more masculine attributes and roles in society. Yes. You know, in fact, all of society works that way. Because why? Because it's easier to produce one product that satisfies men and women than to, than to you know, create two products for each one. So the more the, the women are feminized and the more the men are masculinized, you know, we sort of make an androgynous center. Right. You know, then we have one, one consumer. We can take care of everything that way. Exactly. No. But again, no one is no one is really satisfied with that. And that I think is why that we sort of come so close towards a sort of an androgynous understanding or a masculinized women and feminized men. This is what I think is producing the reactions that we're seeing kind of on the extremes. I think that's why there is a manosphere now. I think that's why there is kind of a men's movement. I think that's right. why there are, you know, there are online men's organizations and, you know, men like Ryan Mickler, uh, Connor Beaton, Trevor Beam, um, you know, the, um, uh, what are they, uh, the um, um, Sacred Sons, you know, to mention, you know, just, just a handful you know, the groups that are doing yeoman's work to try to help men out. I mean, what my dad did, our dads didn't need that. Right. Why do we need it? You know, clearly something has changed. Yeah.
something's missing. Something uh, is missing, and and there's a reaction. There's a reaction to it. Manosphere is very much a reactive thing, and things that are reactive are inherently unstable, and I don't trust them. Right. There's a difference between reacting and responding, and that requires a little pause, take a deep breath, and you know, in you know, involve the little gray cells, uh, <laughs> as Poirot would say, you know, in order to make a reasonable response to things. Um, yeah, this is try not to be reactive. Right. No, I totally agree with you that the manosphere is generally reactive. I mean, that's the whole thing is that the manosphere is totally oriented around feminism and females yeah. as opposed to goal orientedness for men. And that's where I think orthodoxy provides uh, men an opportunity to look forward and look up as opposed to look back and look down. Um, yeah, I think so. And I would nuance there what you said. I think the Manosphere several years ago was focused on women and and and, and feminism. Uh, I think they realized that was far too narrow a focus, which is why you sort of even got kind of a reaction within the Manosphere, which began looking more at personal self-development. That's where, yeah. you know, lift and read the sidebar, right. you know, came from. And so, so make yourself the best man you can be. And that's where we excuse me, that's where we find a lot of the more popular online men's coaches and, and uh, providers in the uh, men's self-development arena uh, are really talking about, yeah, go out, optimize your life, optimize your ability to make money, uh, optimize your, you know, your... And I, your, I'm with all those income. things. I yeah, think I do them. You know, Bedros, you know, calls them the four F bombs, but Bedros would, you <laughs> know, but their faith, family, finances, and fitness. Yeah. You know, every orthodox man, I think that should be a focus. And so yeah. it ties into what I wanted to sort of wrap up our conversation with is that, you know, you're into bodybuilding and yes. I I'm into bodybuilding and I don't compete like you do. But how I've had so many people get upset that are orthodox. I can't believe you're so focused on your body or I can't believe you're so focused on lifting weights and men, men becoming muscular. Name me a monk that told people that they need to focus on their body and lift weights. And I said, well, the monks, they're not married. There's a different role and obligation responsibility yeah. for a family man versus a monk. But my point is getting into this differentiation. You highlighted the androgyny that's coming. Mm -hmm. And I, I've noticed this too. When I look at, you know, go out, go out on the street and look at 20 year old people often from behind the width of a of the boy and the girl are about the same yeah yeah uh, at least they're all skinny <laughs> <laughs> yeah so physical fitness is is one of the ways in which we men can begin to differentiate ourselves you maybe you don't have your your money in place I, I maybe you don't have your career you're not sure what but you can go take care of your health and your body and the fact that, as we all highlight, there is a difference between men and women, and men are physically stronger. Yeah, I think every man should should be focusing on developing that physical strength, and that's going to aid in discipline. That's going to oh, aid yeah. in goal orientedness. That's going to aid oh, yeah. in self confidence to be a better man in all these different things. Yeah, and that is why uh, many of us who do men's work and try to provide some content that way always stress lifting, or. A, a decent martial arts. I, I, decent, I, yeah. yeah, you can Something make an physical. argument on, on, on either side. They, they both have their pros and cons. Yeah. I have a delight pumping iron. Yeah, me too. Uh, but I mean, the, the yeah, part, first of all, orthodoxy is an, is an incarnate embodied faith. And our bodies partake of our, you know, of, of spiritual realities. And so the body <laughs> needs ascetical training just as much as the soul does. <laughs> Uh, yes, a potential for violence. Yeah, you don't get the big guy never gets picked on. Right. You know? Well, and anybody is this. I talked with George, anybody who goes to a gym or martial arts, the, the biggest, baddest dudes are almost always the nicest. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because they don't have that burden of trying to prove themselves all the time. That's right. You know, it's the guys who are almost there that are dangerous. It's, it's the brown belt phenomenon. I remember when I was a karate student. You know, you had to watch out for the brown belts. The black belts, they were fine, but the brown belts were the cocky ones that are, you know, you know, look looking for a fight to see if this stuff really works. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And I'm curious how, because you mentioned in our last conversation that uh, bodybuilding was something that you unfortunately, regret regrettably, came to later in your life. 
Yeah. And I'm curious, how does the physical fitness, how is this tied in with you being a men's coach, being an Orthodox priest, now okay. being a bodybuilder? You talked about, you know, being a stay at home father, maybe that some of the roles were reversed. Is this tied to even how you lacked the development of your own physique as a man? Was that tied to your masculine? I mean, how could you no, could you yeah, explain that a little bit? Yeah, it's it sort of is, and I'm 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 going to be shamelessly self promotional here. Uh, my most recent video on my own YouTube page, you can you can look my name or average yeah. to alpha AVG. Well, and, and you're in the video title, so everybody watching, you can they can click directly on the title of oh, the, okay. the stream, and your link is right there. It's, okay, it's average oh, thank to you. Alpha. Yeah, if you find me on YouTube, my latest YouTube video uh, is why I pump iron and why you should too. <laughs> uh, where I, I actually go into great detail over all of this. Uh, I actually, I'm old enough to have seen old Charles Atlas ads in the back of comic books <laughs> when I was eight years old. It was the same year my dad died, so it's probably tied to that somehow. But I'd wanted to get into shape and look good my whole life, and I was the fat kid, and I was incredibly intimidated uh, by well-built people most of my life. It was hard to be in the same room with them. I don't know why, but it was. And then I was the middle-aged guy who, you know, was on the elliptical and never really lost any fat, who pumped iron and never really got any stronger. And finally, when I was 53, I said, I, I wanted to get in shape when I was 20, 30, 40, and 50. I said to my wife, I want to regret something else when I'm 60, please, but it's not going to be this, <laughs> you know? And she said, okay, I'll support you. So I found an online coach, uh, did one of those 12-week transformation things, and I lost 40 pounds. And the muscles started going on, and um, I work really well under a deadline and with a, a timeline. So I said, hmm, I could do men's physique. I could wear board shorts. You know, that's modest. I could stand up in front of total strangers and wear board shorts. I think I can do this. So <laughs> that was the first thing that I did. And, uh, uh, yeah, I lost 40 pounds. I lost 8 inches off my waist. I went from 23 to 8% body fat. Whoa. And that kind of hooked me. I, I loved the process and I loved the competition. So I, I've done it for the last nine years. I've competed 12 times. I just finished my last contest three weeks ago. It wow. went poorly. Everyone else was bigger than me. But I have no control over who else shows up right. But I think I, I think I've hung up the trunks for good now. I, I think I'm I'm done with that. But uh, sort of the way I realized it was, I have realized my physical potential. I have carried my body about as far as I can. And there are very few people who push their limits that far in any, any you know, capacity or, or, or way. But I managed to do it at least with my body. Uh, it's not good enough to win on stage anymore. I have won my class. Uh, five or six times. I did qualify to go to nationals and I competed on a national stage once, uh, which was wonderful. But yeah, it's just not in the cards anymore. So uh, we'll look to do other things. But you're not going to stop lifting. Oh, hell no. No, right. I was I was there this morning. Yeah, I still lift six or try. Right. I aim for seven days a week, but life gets in the way. So I usually end up four or five or six. Yeah, you know, I just had I leg day today. I I'm gonna be slowly walking on the fourth. I, I'll I'll need a few a few sips of some neat whiskey. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, actually, we've we've already my gym will be open until three o'clock. So I'll get up in the morning. I'll go to the gym in the morning, and then yeah, I'm gonna hit chest tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, chest is my favorite day. Um, I liked I always liked back day myself because oh, okay. I was like, well, you're a monster on the pull ups. Yeah, well, see, that was it. I it was I was like 54 before I could ever do one. I practiced that stuff to do a lots of lots of chins, and uh, I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you a story. So one day, the, the the day that I was recording that one video where I, I cranked out 20 and I got bored and, and dropped after that, but in the next uh, squat rack over, there were these two young guys and they were getting ready to squat. So. You know they're doing their thing they're setting up the bar and you know and putting starting to put on plates and get their belts ready and on them just pop up there and so i'm i'm chitting myself three four five six and one of them is this double take <laughs> you know so i'm at eight nine ten eleven twelve the second one starts that does this double take so i like i say i got bored at 20 and i quit 
and they sort of looked at each other. Then one of them came over to me, and this is beautiful. It always happens. They always start, sir. <laughs> I love it. The young guys always call me, sir. Sir, um, could I ask how old you are? <laughs> so I said, how old do I look? And he was off by seven or eight years. I said, thank you. I said, I'm 61, because I, I did that last year. You're 61? Wow, I wish my, my dad's that age. I wish he looked as good as you do. But no, he sits on the couch and has a beer belly and yada, yada, yada. So, thank you. You know, But uh, it's always kind of fun like that when, when you encounter the young people. Um, one of the things that uh, I do mention in, in the video on my, my website, though, is the witness that I had in my congregation when I lost the weight too. There were two men, uh, one in my congregation, one in a neighboring congregation who each lost over a hundred pounds. Wow. As a result of the fact that I lost mine and they, they knew, they saw what I could do. And they said, well, if father can do this, then so can I. And one little old 17, 73 year old widow who started going to, to planet fitness <laughs> uh, on my witness, which uh, that's my favorite story. A little yaya. Yeah, yeah started going to Planet Fitness, uh, which actually helped her with her depression because she became a widower the year before her husband died. Oh. So she had time and she needed to do something and she saw that it, it improved my life. So she went to the gym and it helped her work through, you know, her depression and all. And it, it was a beautiful thing. You know, so uh, uh, yeah, y y you never know. You never know. When, when you do something good, when you do something notable, um, other people do some sometimes actually do take notice and it can have a positive influence. Of course, there are the naysayers, you know, and the people, oh, you know, he just likes to look in the mirror, you know, yeah. and that sort of stuff. It's just vanity. And all. I, I got two last questions. One, have you heard criticism from other priests or people within the church about you bodybuilding or? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Some people just. They just don't, they just don't understand the sport, don't understand why I do it and cannot imagine their priest, you know, who usually wears cassock and full vestments wearing that little scrap of spandex, uh, <laughs> which I fully understand. So actually, I rarely mention my lifting uh, in, in my parish just for that. I don't need to cause offense. Right. You know, and then I was curious, how has developing your physique influenced your own perception of yourself and your masculinity and how has that influenced other people and how they perceive you uh when i lost about half the weight uh because i had, was finally successful at something i'd wanted to do most of my life my self-confidence went through the roof and i got a lot less shit from the women in my parish and a lot more respect from the men there is something called you may have heard of the halo effect Mm -hmm. Whereas if you look good, people assume you're successful, you're friendly, you're rich. They assume a lot of positive qualities about you right. and also that I was more formidable. And had I known that I would get less trouble in my in my parish simply by losing weight, I might have done it decades ago you know, and saved myself a ton of grief. Uh, but yeah, it did that. And look, lifting heavy is going to raise your testosterone. You're going to feel better. You know, I have trouble lifting heavy now because arthritis is setting in and my joints are wearing out and I just hurt all the time. So I've had to cut back on how heavy I lift. Uh, but, you know, it helps with bone density. It prevents osteoporosis. It does keep what testosterone I have up, yep. um, you know, and just the overall feeling that you know, it, it, really the, the self-confidence that is there just persists and you know i can stand up straight and i'm i'm happy i am comfortable in my own skin which i wasn't for most of my life and that's really kind of a nice feeling it really right. is and again simply physical strength is one of the characteristics of masculinity and so um you know the fact that i can be as strong as i am for my age uh is something that's very meaningful to me I'm the best built yep. 62 year old I know. <laughs> You're the the most fit 62 year old I know as well. Um, but as we finish up here, and guys, if you have any questions or anything, you can send them in right now. We have no other super chats other than Gabriel. I'm uh, talking about the military and Dr. Vagisil, which I'll read here in just a moment. But I watched your conversation with George over on his channel, the the more recent one, and it was about advice to young men. I'm on trying to find a wife and 
Um, I, it, just to conclude this video, we've kind of hit on so many different topics. It's, it's everywhere that I wanted to, to go in regards to our conversation, but what would be your advice for young men listening this, that, um, are getting their head on straight in regards to the relationship with God and the church, um, but feel disenfranchised, feel like they're never going to be able to find a wife or a little unsure, like what they're, they're supposed to be doing with their life. Um, could you could you speak to those people uh, uh, before we get into the super chats here? You all right? You still there? Uh, you know, I'm here. For, forgive me. I was I was taking a little look at the chats over here. I'm sorry. It's, ask the question again. I thought you were talking to somebody else. Nope, nope. I was talking to you. Oh, my apologies. <laughs> it's all right. Um, it's probably late in the conversation. Yeah, it's all good. Um, I mean, when we get off here, I don't mean that you've been very gracious. You already given me two hours. We've already been talking for two hours, but um, uh, so we have. <laughs> yeah, I went by pretty fast. Um, I was saying that if you could speak to, um, I watched your conversation with George Bruno oh, conversation recently. With George. Yeah, okay. and and it Forgive was me. themed, and what you guys eventually got into was talking about how to find a wife, mm. and um, you know. I guarantee you there's going to be multiple men that watch this stream um, and they're going to probably have their head on straight in regards to the church and God mm -hmm. and the relationship with Christ. But they're going to be very pessimistic, very pessimistic about their, the chances of them finding a wife, uh, figuring out how they're going to make money, what their career is, what their purpose is, where they're supposed to go. And so uh, I was wondering if we could, before we get into some of the super chat, just speak to the young man that I know they're probably live right now, but I know that many of them are going to watch that. They, they feel like orthodoxy is they've probably gone through the theology, but um, not very optimistic in regards to everything else in their life. How, how, what was some, what's some grace in some, some wisdom that you could give them in regards to uh, the looking forward from this point forward and, and, and finding a wife and finding a purpose and finding their place in the hierarchy, as we talked about earlier. Okay. Um, with regards to, I, I think somewhat the advice is the same with regards to finding a wife and also doing well. Um, the only variable in both those equations that you have any control over is yourself. You know, so what are you going to do? What do you bring to the table? You want a relationship? Yeah, I've seen in some other places. I see this incredible list of all of the attributes that a young man wants or demands to have in a woman. And sort of my gut <laughs> reaction is, well, okay, bro, what do you bring to the table? Right. And that's you know, always what I say. Yeah. Are 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 you also, you know, are, are you willing to meet her criteria? You know, do you meet her criteria? What do women want? Do you even know what a woman wants in a man? It ain't the same thing that a guy wants in a woman. This is a right. serious mistake for a lot of people. They think we think that women want the same thing that men want, and 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 it ain't so. They want something completely different. Okay, or there is some overlap, but there are a lot of other things that women look for in men uh, uh, that men don't give so much thought to in women. So knowing what a woman wants, and are you willing to provide that? Can you provide that? Okay, and also with regards to the rest of your life, whether it be job, you know, vocation, um, interests, or whatnot. Again, what do you bring to the table? You know, are, are you well-trained? Are you well-educated? Do you have a job? Do you take a bath every day? You know, in some cases. <laughs> seriously, seriously. seriously man, no, I, I, I actually have done one-on-ones. I told somebody, bro, how are you? You want a virgin Orthodox girl? Dude, you're 40 pounds overweight, and it, do, it doesn't even look like you've showered today. Look at yourself. Look at your hair. Look at your clothes. And, and the lack of self-awareness. Yeah. And then you get into these purity spirals. She has to be orthodox. She has to be ethnic. She has to be a virgin. She has to be this. She has to be unvaxxed. Yeah. You know, it's the latest, latest one that I've seen. You know, and, and my thought is, well, God bless you, and I hope that you find her, but I think she's somewhere in rural Saskatchewan, and good luck getting to her. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I'm not saying necessarily lower your standards, but let's look around and see what, you know, what is reasonable, you know, out here and let's go make a, let's go make a life. Yes. Women want love and men want respect. That's absolutely so. 
So what can a young man do to earn that respect? As one of the men, uh, again, frustrated probably with the Kevin Samuels and of the world that demonstrated all these women overvaluate themselves and they want a man who's, you know, six, 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 six figures, six, 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 pack, six foot. But, um, you know, if you want the respect from the woman, you're going to have to, as you said, you're going to have to rise to her standards. You have to be respectable. Right. You no. Know? And again, I, I, you know, you're, you're the only variable that you control. So yeah, you know, if you want to be in the top 10%, if you want to be noticed, it's, it's rough out there. It's not impossible. Actually, I, I don't, I don't think you really need to be in the top 10%. I mean, I, I, I look around, uh, where was I? I've been in, oh, it was, I was at a big fireworks display, um, um, uh, last week down in downtown Detroit. There's several thousand people around there. You know, there ain't many of us that look like we ever touched a weight. You know, there weren't many of us who actually had on a shirt with a collar, you know. I mean, you know, guys running around with, you know, holy t-shirts, workout shorts, and flip-flops. Not the best look. Yeah. You know, take a little pride in your appearance. Take a little pride in your work. Try to excel at your job. You know, your boss should weep at the thought of losing you. You know, that's kind of what I what I what I've said to, to some guys, you know, before. Optimize your appearance. Do the best you can with what you got. You know, seriously. And you know, and it's a little attention to detail. You think, oh my God, it's so overwhelming. He wants me to do everything. No, bro, start with one thing. Okay, look, do what Uncle Jordan says. Get up and make your bed. <laughs> yeah. that'll put you on the right path okay bathe every day you know trim the beard the mustache go, go to george george is a specialist on this you know take care of your appearance you know right. do the, like i say you're not all as good looking as i am i'm i can't help that you know <laughs> but do the best that you can with what you've got you know uh decent clothes you know if you ever get into to, to people who talk about everyday carry there's some really fascinating discussions on people who are into everyday carry you know, so, you know, what have you got? You got a, a decent fountain pen that you use, you know, you have nice implements and tools. Do you carry a good pocket knife? Is your wallet nice? Your cell phone case? You know, if you're required to carry materials with you, do you have a, you know, is your backpack the same ratty thing you've been carrying since undergrad? Right. You know, a little attention to some of these things. Are, are, are you interesting to talk to? Can you carry on a conversation, you know, about anything other than the last, three video games that you've played. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, seriously, some people, you know, it's, it's a problem with, with uh, like people who go to school for a job, like, you know, people who go to school for nursing can only talk about nursing and medicine. You know, as like people who go to school for engineering can only talk about engineering. No, you know, oh, hand shoes and what, there it is. Focus on those three things. Look, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I always tell you got to have a watch and, and an easy watch. thing to do is just have your watch, your belt and your shoes match. And you look like okay. you're you look See, like you're together. I, I, I am an old man when I carry one. I carry well, your clergy. Watch. You're outside time. Yeah, you're, you're not confined by time. time. <laughs> <laughs> tell me who gets grayer and older every day that I'm outside of time. please. There is. OK, hands, shoes and watches. George says that's where you start. Listen to Uncle George. Yep. And pay attention to those things. Okay. I would not have thought shoes, but now that he says it, I can see it. Okay. Right. So, you know, but like I say, whatever you got, optimize it. And there are no guarantees. They really aren't. But you bring your best package to a job interview, to your work, to your church. Off, you know, we want to offer our best to God. Okay. Let's offer good, you know, even to potential women. You know, to everyone else that's around us, let's be men of quality. You know, if we're going to represent, if we're going to call ourselves Orthodox men, let's represent Christ and his church in the best way that we can. Right. You know, and that doesn't mean that we have to be boastful or, or, or anything like that. But simple standards of being clean and well kept, you know, go a really long way. And you look around and the standard is pretty damn low. It's very low. It's it doesn't very low. take that much to stand out yeah and you know if you want a woman you need to catch her eye do just that little bit that will allow you to stand out you don't have to be you know you just have to be this much better than the people you're with 
Yeah. You, know? you don't you have to be Brad Pitt. No, you don't have and to be it, Brad Pitt. Yeah. Yeah. And when you were talking about, uh, you know, the last three video games, one of the things that I've talked to with some of the Orthodox young men is, you know, talking about the energy essence distinction and how many saints you've read also isn't the best conversation piece with a girl. Now, not grant, you know, granted, there are many girls in this community that are versatile with theology. You know, yeah, but generally speaking, totally if you're an that. Orthodox man and you're talking to another Orthodox girl at church or there's a cute girl you want to like, don't bring up church history and theology as the way that you're going to connect with her. That's I something don't. you do with bros. You know, we, yeah, we're, we're nerds. We like theology, but have something different to talk about with a young woman at church. Yeah. I know of a marriage that, that fell apart because the wife was reading the ascetical homilies of St. Isaac in bed at night, <laughs> probably not a lot else going on in bed. You yeah. know, yeah, D yeah, don't, d don't, don't lead with theology. And, you know, let's extrapolate a little. An old priest once told me, he says, we shout Christ from the housetops. We whisper the Theotokos in the ear. And I think there's a mm. lot of Orthodox theology that we whisper in the ear and we don't lead with. Toll houses. You idiots. Don't talk about them. Right. Right. <laughs> exactly. Come on. Exactly. All right. So that's a pet peeve of mine. Yeah, you know, I just hate going there. No, so. it's true though. It's true though. And I, I again I've done one-on-ones and I've talked with some very intelligent young men, very sharp. And they knew what they're talking about. They've read tons of books. They knew philosophy, theology. They're they're 24, 25. There's a cute girl at the church, and they're like, Yeah, I was we sat and I was talking to her about, you know, church, you know, church history or this saint. And I'm like, bro, dude, anything like it, she's it, already it, there. It, Don't yeah. like talk yeah. to her about anything else yeah and maybe she'll be into that but just generally speaking i would say that that's just a good a good reference is if if the cute girl is already at liturgy you don't have to show her how much you know about you know the the uncreated energies of god and how we how you know the process of theosis and how this all works you just you know be interesting and talk to her about yeah. something to maintain her interest yes and there as george says be the most interested man in the world yeah. Oh, have yeah. To, have, some, have a variety of interests. I, I tell you what. Yeah. My undergraduate degree was a broad liberal arts degree. I, I went to a, a little Catholic college. It was like a great books program. Okay. That in $2.89 gets me coffee at Panera's. Granted. But I had to take classes in history, philosophy, economics, mathematics, art history, foreign languages, literature. Man, I remember a lot of that stuff. Yeah, I can talk about a lot of different things and carry on com an intelligent conversation about a lot of different subjects. Mm -hmm. And that's a really sweet skill to have. Right. Because it doesn't matter who I meet, I can find something in common to talk about. Right. You know, and not shuffle my feet and look at the ground. And that's an opportunity for all the above average intelligent young men is that take that intelligence and just be, as George said, more interested in the world. So it gives you more more fodder to, to have a conversation and talk about anything. And so, yeah. and so get and, and another thing too, gentlemen, ask her questions, not, not, in, in, not to interrogate her, but get her to talk about things that she's interested in what she likes. And then just, just riff off that, stay on that. Yeah. yeah. And as, as I see in the comments over here, they're talking about different kinds of attire. That's fine. I mean, if you can carry it off and make it look good, more power to you. You know, there are there are things I can wear that you can't. And there's a lot more things you can wear that I can't. You know? <laughs> and that's fine. You know, again, play to your strengths. You know? right. Play to your strengths. If you got a little bit of your little chubby there, then you don't want really tight shirts. You know, you don't want horizontal stripes. You know, that you, you can find out about this stuff. It's all of it's on yeah. you. George will help you guys with that. And George will help you. That's yeah, right. Go listen to George. George. Is our great resource on that. So uh, <laughs> exactly, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply honored that you know that he's he's been on this and has, and has been with us this time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, shout out to George Bruno. God bless you, brother. Um, Doctor Vagisil throws in one dollar and he says public school teaches boys to avoid mistakes and to say the right things to get affirmation from authority figures, and this makes them feminine. Yes, men. When they do feel lost after college, they beat themselves up and don't know how to find their purpose. 
Yeah. Yeah. The um, um, one of the things that I tell people in every circumstance, beating yourself up is one of the worst things you can do about anything. I get this a lot uh, in confession. You know, oh, Father, I said I wouldn't do that, and I did it again. I'm so ashamed to come back to confession with it. No, no, look, when you beat yourself up over anything that you've done, that's pride. You've already committed one sin, and now you think you're better than that, and so you're ashamed of yourself, and you beat yourself up because you, you thought you were better than that. That's just pride. So you're laying a second layer of pride on top of the first sin that you committed, and now you have two. Quit that. <laughs> just quit it. Yeah, you're, great point. Look, I'm, I'm sorry. You're not that good, all right? You're really <laughs> not. You really are that nasty or that hateful or that mean or whatever it is. You really are. Let's just own it repent of it sincerely and get on but this is why for example you know the holy father say you know but it says in, in some of the, the orthodox prayer books you know if your mind wanders gently bring your mind back to attention and continue along the prayers we are reading if you fall be gentle with your heart god forgive me for having fallen in that way you know i promised to do better and i didn't you know be merciful to me but don't beat yourself up over it. Because again, that's just pride. Right. Right. Okay. Stop that. Frankie D throws in 999. It says, something you were saying about the rise of the manosphere made me think about the internet as a male-dominated domain. Matters of the polity are also masculine domains, philosophy, theology, etc. Any thoughts on that? They seem largely to be that maybe because um you know for the longest time women weren't allowed to university you know uh, in part uh there are some things that there are some fields where it just seemed to be more suitable to men's sensibilities than women's mm -hmm. it's why for example nowadays you know people scream about the inequality of or how few women are engineers now and yet men seem to have an easier time with you know like spatial relations you know and right. stuff and complex mathematics not to yeah. say some women can't but in complex general, abstractions complex mathematics abstractions philosophy. and all yes men seem in general have an easier time with that and it has to do actual with with brain structure you know and the fact that you know we were fighters and predators and all that and needed certain you know capacities that women didn't need Right. So, I mean, th there are objective biological reasons why, you know, some men are suited, more suited to some fields than others. Uh, I don't know what the ratio is nowadays uh, in philosophy or theology or whatnot. Um, there, I, when I was in graduate school, and this was ugh, 40 years ago, um, there were, there's about a third of the classes were women. I suspect that they've increased in the years just as opportunities have have increased for that yeah uh yeah. the internet is a male dominated domain yeah because tech coding and computer science seems to be one of those areas where men simply uh excel it's also boring it's also detail oriented it's extremely nerdy you know i i, I don't know if you know if you if, if men on the spectrum do really well in those sorts of things it might be uh, and some women are just bored to tears with that kind of stuff. So, no, it is true. It is true. And in fact, a, a Swedish philosopher of my acquaintance by the name of Alexander Bard, you know, was pointing out that, yes, the uh, women have begun, begun to be, have begun to dominate in, in uh, business, in law, in politics, and in another, a number of other uh, dominant social spheres, but that is not where real power lies anymore. Right. Real power lies in the in the centers where the internet are prominent in Silicon Valley, in Seattle, in Shanghai, uh, and other places like that. That is where real power is accumulating, and it is exclusively male. Right. I I don't know if I buy his argument, but that's one of the yeah. few kind of quotations or informed. Right. Uh, 
uh, opinions that that I can offer an answer to your question. Yeah, it sounds. It feels like social media is becoming maybe more female dominated. But I I would agree with your general assessment. Then about the actual infrastructure of the internet, maintaining it, technology. It, it's always it, and it will continue to be because that's just the nature of men. Like engineering is still, I think, like an eighty twenty split between yeah. male female. And, yeah. and one of the one of the things with social media. Uh, I've heard it said that social media is the equivalent of porn. The social media is the equivalent of porn for women. Yeah. And part of it is it's the whole validation thing. Yeah. Attention. Uh, they look at, oh, you, they post a picture. Oh, you're so beautiful. Oh, so lovely. You know, a bunch of guys go simping after it. And uh, look, when, when I started on social media about, it was about 10 months ago the, that I started having, you know, my business coach actually suggested that I do this every day. He incentivized me to do it. <laughs> um, and I noticed, yeah, there's a real rush when people start liking your post or the first one that gets 10,000 views or something. You, you got to watch for that. Yeah, it right. can go to your head. Right. It, it, be, it becomes a, a narcissism, which I think, unfortunately, things like Instagram specifically have really affected women. Frankie D throws in another 999. Thank you so much, Frankie D. And he says, I disagree with some of the advice because I can look back on photos of the 70s and see these nerdy dudes with giant glasses and busted haircuts getting married. Men have not changed, standards have. Um, I think there are there are there are on the okay. I think this I think this bears a little bit of unpacking. Yeah. Uh first off, fashion does change. Uh, the fact that, you know, I, I heard it called TikTok hair, you know, that that teenage boys now have this poof of hair in the front of their head that, that covers their forehead. And, you know, I, I see young guys looking. It looks like me trying to get to my trifocals, you know, <laughs> walking around the gym like this because they got so much hair, you know, down here. Uh, fashion changes and keeping up with fashion is one way of standing out. Uh, other people, it doesn't matter if it's, uh, you know, bell bottoms and giant glasses and also on the one hand, that's a matter of fashion. Um, there are some nerdy dudes all managed to get married. It is true. I do think men, men have changed somewhat. Uh, granted, some standards have changed, but men, yeah. men have, okay, and I'll tell you this, I'll, I'll be polemical and, and, and push back a little bit here on you, on you, Frankie D. Okay, I will agree that men have not changed. Uh, that much since the 70s. And I refer you to the first two pages of Robert Bly's book, Iron John, mm. in the introduction where he complains about the young men in his day. And he was saying he was started to do workshops and all in the 1970s, where he, he where he first encountered what he called soft males. Says, oh, you know, they weren't interested in hurting the environment or hurting the planet, and they were all supportive of their partners and all but they didn't have any energy and something fierce was required for life. And like, these guys didn't have it at all. Well, we call them beta males now, right. or we call them wimps or we call them simps. So in one respect, you know, men, not a lot has changed in the last 50 years. The situation with men is, is kind of dire. It may be a little worse now. I, I'm not real sure. Uh, my, I was around in the seventies, but I was a teenager and not paying too much attention at the time. So I, you know, I, I, I can't do an objective comparison. Um, but yeah, standards have changed. And as I referenced earlier in, in, in the talk, about every five to 10 years, someone decides to redefine masculinity again. You know, and we, I, I remember when Alan Alda was held up as a male sex symbol and a symbol of modern masculinity in the 1970s or early 80s. And it was like, well, he was a nice, he was basically what we call a nice guy today. You know, not not physically imposing, uh, quiet, sort of withdrawn, polite, very respectful of women and all of that. And you know, sort of, you know, women change their hairstyle. Men have to change their entire personalities you know, in order to keep up with fashion. Yeah. I don't I, think that's fair. I personally disagree with Frankie D's disagreement. Um, because the idea that, uh, there's nerdy guys in the seventies that got married and look at today. Well, Hunter Avalon was married. There's all these betas that are, that are getting married. These, all these simpy guys that are getting married, uh, that had that regardless and the change in standards. I would, again, I do put the blame ultimately on men. I think Western men are weak because Western men, since the baby boomers and since the 20th century, have become consumers. 
So, oh, okay. um, so the fact that that men, generally speaking, in the West are consumers, we have allowed women to become the way they are. And so I believe men, by not being men and maintaining standards and expectations for women, have allowed the society to get to the way they are. And so um, whether some nerdy dude got married in the 70s or not, it's totally regardless of whether that marriage was successful, if they didn't get divorced, how many children they had, did she respect him, did she truly have attraction for him? And so I really don't get the point. I don't okay. get the point. He clarifies uh, it. He clarifies it in the in the chat. He says he's oh. using hyperbole to convey a point that I think men relatively have the same interests. I assume as as they did then, and women just aren't interested in them. Okay, let me get that uh, real quick. At six twenty eight. Uh, okay, I'm using hyperbole to convey a point that I think men relatively have the same interests, and women just aren't interested in them. Ah. Uh, I don't think men have the same interest, dude. Like Adam 22, this huge guy on YouTube was just got married to a girl that a week ago, she just did her only fans porn with some big black guy and the whole point. And so then he today on Twitter talked about how he's into cunking. No, I don't think that men have the same interest. I think traditional men have the same interest and I think traditional women have the same interest. And so um, I think that people who have bought into the culture don't have the same interests. And this idea that men are the same, I, I totally do not agree with. Um, at least I look at my dad. He's a very traditionally masculine military guy. I don't see many guys my age that are like that. I just don't. And so is it is it is it that uh, men have changed? Well, I think men and women have changed. But I don't think the things that make healthy relationships have changed. I don't think things that make healthy marriages have changed. And so I think by us becoming the best men and then expecting those values out of the women, I, I totally agree with. Um, so I think I, I have one foot in Frankie D's camp. I have one foot out of it because I do not think that the change is on the women's end. Absolutely not. Yeah, um, I mean, objectively. Uh, objectively, you know, testosterone levels have declined what, 1% a year. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So just, I, I, yeah. And so Frankie D does say in the subsequent, I'm trying, I'm trying to, to, to fall, keep up with this a little bit, uh, more beta males now. Yeah. I definitely more beta are. males. There now. was social yeah. enforcement. Yeah. There were, there were clearer, yes. and narrower, uh, norms of masculine and feminine behavior. And now sort of diversity has taken care of that. So yeah. yeah, we sort of we we do like some of those. Yeah, yeah and I yeah, agree. In that, Frank, respect, in that respect, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, and I think we're coming closer to an agreement here because there, if there are absolutely more beta males in a variety of situations, see, Adam twenty two is this guy who does OnlyFans porn with his girl, who then she does porn with other guys. He does stuff with other women, and they just had a marriage. That's not a marriage. That's not that's not being married. No. But. Uh, he has money, he has social status, and he has women. So according to secular standards, he's a high value man. That's not a high value man. A high value man lives up to high values. There's nothing of high value of a person who's like that. So um, I, I definitely think there's more beta males. Even beta, I consider, I consider Adam 22 a beta male. I think a man who lets his woman sleep with other men and gets off to it is a cuck. That is a beta. That there's nothing alpha, there's nothing masculine, there's nothing traditional about that. And the fact that that is growing in our society is an is indication of the changing of men, which then changes and allows women to be way more promiscuous because he's into he's into the promiscuity. So in the lack of social enforcement is the is the well, you could get into multiple factors, be it the influence of multiculture multi-languages, multi-religions, all this stuff has, has undermined a societal cohesion. Um, the, the sacred canopy, as, as Peter Berger, the sociologist, talks about, cultures have sacred canopies, and those that are under that canopy um, legitimate the same value structure. So are we, are, is America under a, a single sacred canopy of values? I don't think so. No. And you, you are aware, do you know the book, the, uh, the Sacred Canopy? There was a book written. About yeah, three decades ago. Peter Berger. Oh, you got it. There you go. Yeah. The sacred canopy. There you are. Yep. He's yep. a he's a Protestant sociologist from the 70s. And yeah. I I I love his theory of legitimation and how culture and sacred canopies emerge. I think it's totally on point. Yeah. 
but uh yeah so frankie d i think i think i agree with you uh definitely in regards to more beta males and the lack of social reinforcement um i am skeptical that women have changed more than men i think men have changed maybe slowly and then that has allowed women to change more abruptly to the to the uh, culture that might be a possibility i need to think it out a little bit more uh but he says yeah unfortunately the state allowed women to again that's huge the no fault divorce agree with frankie d that's huge that is absolutely undermines uh you know the sacredness of marriage um Oh, sorry. And, um, and, uh, yeah, so I totally agree there. Let, let's just wrap up real quick. Sorry. Uh, Frankie D threw in four nine. I says, nah, bro. Can she cook clean, be submissive? Can you, Kevin Samuels asked that question. Men just need to realize they are the prize. Women have a duty too. Well, nobody would say women don't have uh, standards or duties. And again, if you're Orthodox, both partners have duties. And I think if you are asking her if she can cook clean and be submissive, you must already be a man that has the ability to provide, protect, and uh, earn respect. So, and uh, I, would, I, you know, I would add, you know, to realize that we are the prize. No, we must. We true, but we must genuinely be the prize. Right. You know, that's what I. That's what I was saying earlier. You know, we need to optimize our own lives. You know, what are we bringing to the table? Uh, we need to be, we need, and uh, as George was saying, yeah, we need to be not only high value, but high virtue as well. And if we can do that, then I think it's easy. Women will find us attractive. Right. And Jesse Miller throws in $5 says base channel. Thank you so much, Jesse Miller for that. And, and father has to go here. So let's wrap up. Uh, Frankie D throws in another nine 99. Thank you so much, Frankie D for your support. He's, he's a big time supporter. So but this is, uh, no, this Frankie, is, this is true. Yeah. And I see what he's saying. Yes. There are no guarantees. There really aren't because we're talking relationships between people who all have free will and they make their own choices. But what choice do we have other than to optimize our own lives and to become the best men that we can be? It's the only thing that we yeah. can control. So if we can do that, yeah, maybe there's a woman there, maybe not. But we put ourselves in the best possible position in order to find one. And I, you know, I'm, I, I tend to be a, a hopeful man. And right. so I think if we can do those things, no, there are no guarantees, but things yeah. are definitely better. Yeah. And I agree with Frankie D here. And this is where I think the church is the last option. I mean, it is salvation, not in just obviously the theological sense, the ultimate sense, but even in the worldly, uh, the worldly sense, the things that men are facing that I think if you are a man who's become the prize and you're orthodox, that God's providence can do a lot with that. And you may have to wait, you may have to do something, but if you're pursuing the right things, you know, this isn't a prosperity gospel. But if you are that which a girl who's working on herself and becoming the best version of her to be a good wife, well, now you're 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 a suitor and God can make that providence happen. And I've experienced that in my own life. And that's what I think it's incredibly hopeful for traditional young men who really are take it seriously on their on their own self-development that God can do a lot with you. And, and that's the ultimate goal here, which also includes giving you the perfect woman for who you are and what your skill sets are. So. Father, we'll end with that. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic. I did not mean to keep you for two and a half hours, uh, so I apologize. I didn't. I didn't realize I had been on for two and a half hours. You know, this, I, I guess it's one of those flow states. You know, and when <laughs> the passage of time is just gone. But uh, I've missed my dinner. I know that, uh, which is fine. <laughs> my my wife knows how these things go, and so she's, uh, uh, you know, she she's quite good to me. Uh, but yeah, I do have other things. I need yeah, to do no tonight. problem. Thank you. Uh, thank yeah, you thank so you much so for much. having me on uh, in all of the things I say and, and to everyone who was kind enough to listen and all, uh, you know, I, I don't set out to be offensive. So, you know, if I've said anything that that was offensive, I ask your forgiveness for that. If I mean to be offensive, you'll know it. OK, so <laughs> yeah. I hope I did not go there. And uh uh, that we all seek the truth, we all seek Christ, and uh, let's lift each other up. And and like I say, let's be the best men we can be. Let's be the best women that we can be to the glory of God, for the welfare of his church, for the salvation of our souls, and to make the world a better place. Right. 
And thank you, Frankie D, for all the support, brother. He He's always so generous and supports me uh, so much. So God bless you, Frankie D. Thank you very, very, very much. And thank you, Father, uh, for coming on. God bless you and the work that you're doing. And God bless your family. Um, again, everybody, you can follow his stuff. I have his Instagram and TikTok in the video description. And if you, in the video title, alpha or average two, number numeral two, alpha, 321 is his YouTube handle. So if you click that right there in the video title, it'll take you straight to his YouTube channel. But, Much um, obliged for that. Of course. Pleased of course. to be a service. Really Of am. course. And I will be back either uh, Wednesday or Thursday with another stream. And as always, I'll see you guys then. So until then, God bless. Thanks so much.